Hey, this is Jacob Banks. Check out my album Village on the new YouTube music app. Testing live stream audio.
Hey, everybody. Good morning, good morning. I'm so excited that we're here today together. The mood music is still going, keeping the mood going. Thanks, Kit. All right. We have a short introduction for the day. We're going to try and keep it snappy and quick. Um, but we really, first of all, just want to welcome you. Welcome you to Processing Community Day. Thank you for joining us. So I think we're just going to go through and say hello first. Um, I'm Casey. Hello, 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 hello. All right, we got it. <laughs> Not to make it difficult for you or anything, but <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, so, good morning. Um, I'm the Ben Fry, half of the Casey Reese and Ben Fry, who started the processing project uh, 18 years ago in 2001. Uh, yeah. <laughs> My man. Um, the name processing comes from two things. Uh, it's a play between the definition of computers as machines that process information and the idea of code being part of one's creative process. Uh, that writing software is one link in a broader creative endeavor and the way that it's done is highly iter iterative and the process itself can be as important as the outcome. Uh, processing is a means, not an end. We started the project in part because I was frustrated watching friends and people in Sparta and more talented than me who would otherwise drop out of computer science courses uh, because they were getting tripped up on data structures or O notation or some other eat your vegetables uh, sort of concept in the curriculum that, or that the curriculum had prioritized over engaging students and helping them actually create. Uh, this was an incredible loss to not have their voices contributing to the conversation. We were similarly frustrated by all the esoteric things first necessary to even begin coding, uh, installing multiple software packages, setting environment variables, and finding your way around a complicated development environment. These unnecessary steps create barriers that disproportionately affect the people that you most want to bring into the community, those not naturally drawn to technology um, or computing itself. Uh, so we made it a priority to have a tool that was simple to download and immediately use. Double click, run a write a line of code, have something visual uh, happen on the screen. Run an example, alter the code a bit, and see what happens next. Uh, going a bit further, this is about creators having control over their own tools. Uh, I want people to be impatient with what's readily available to them. I'm less interested in someone creating the next Photoshop, uh, but I do want them to create the tool that is the Photoshop they need for the project that they're actually working on at the time. Um, software can be very daunting, and the technologies and tools that we use can seem very distant. And so I think it's easy to feel detached from them and not feel the, necess the necessity of circumventing them. 
uh, within the system and those systems that we've been given. And I think we've been too willing to use the tools provided to us, created by companies whose primary interest is really their bottom line and not necessarily the artifacts that we create with their products. Um, that's not an anti-corporation or anti-profit sort of mantra, but it's about the importance of understanding, you know, A, where your uh, tools are coming from, and B, the decisions that drive their evolution. It's about having more agency with your own creative process. And that also goes for processing as well. Uh, you should be making things that circumvent and leap past the things that we've done. Uh, and frankly, the sooner that you do this, the better. It's been 18 years and this is exhausting. Uh, open source has always been an important theme for us. Uh, foremost, it's a central part of establishing trust with our uh, community. But for me personally, it was also about paying forward the generosity of so many people who would share their code with me. Uh, this was how I learned to code even before it came, became fashionable to label things as open source or manifestos about free software had even been written. I wanted to benefit the same way, so open source is simply obvious and familiar for us. As far as accessibility, we've also come a long way from when Casey and I started grad school in the late 90s, uh, which was at the tail end of this work being limited to research labs and using computers the size of a mini fridge. Uh, by the early 2000s, you could buy a capable computer for a few hundred dollars, uh, which meant that the means was coming into place. We just needed to provide the platform, with, uh, which Casey and I sought to do via processing. And now in the current decade, the means is ubiquitous and we have newer initiatives like P5JS, which reinterprets our, those original ideas in more contemporary ways. Uh, more importantly, Lauren McCarthy has led the project with a renewed focus on inclusion and diversity, which means we're at a point where we really have more room to consider how this work is situated socially and how we really extend the boundary of the, those participating in the field. As the PCD site says, a focus of this project is to make learning how to program and making creative work with code accessible to diverse communities especially those who might not otherwise have access to these tools and resources. So the sessions today are about digging into what community, accessibility, and diversity actually means in that statement. A field gets interesting and only truly evolves when it expands by bringing in people with different kinds of abilities and experiences. I look forward to spending the day with you all to find our way uh, through to these goals. Thanks. So I wanted to talk about this slide. Um, we were trying to edit down, but I insisted on keeping it because uh, I think this is really important to what we do, and Ben kind of talked about this, but it's also, um, I think, a really clear through line to what is happening today and what all of you are doing. So it's this idea for me, I interpret this as like, first of all, this idea that we don't have to just take the technology that we're given and kind of accept it at that, right? Like, we don't have to just take these black box iPhones and say, oh, okay, I guess I have to use this. Um, we don't have to say that the only tools we can use as artists are things like Photoshop, right? We can make our own. We don't have to agree that, you know, Facebook gets to make the internet. We can make the internet. Um, so I think whether or not you use processing, that spirit of like actually thinking about the world that we want to make and making it happen is something that carries through through all the speakers and sessions and attendees today, and that's what I'm really excited about. Um, and then also this slide had this word learn in here, which is really important to me. I think um, starting out, you can see these people making code and you think like, oh, I had to go to some elite university or work at a big company or be some kind of expert. I'm not gonna, never going to get there. And the whole basis of this is about learning, right? Like the idea with processing was to make learning to code just a little bit easier to do, a little bit more accessible to people that maybe don't relate to just printing out numbers into a command line. Um, and I think it's also this idea of learning in terms of like making mistakes, right? You start doing it and you don't get it right every time and sometimes you just really screw it up and then sometimes those screw ups actually become like the most interesting part of your project. And I think that's what's special about this group here is that we are able to appreciate those mistakes and, and turn that into something wonderful. I don't think that happens in every um, coding situation. And um, the last thing I wanted to say was just for all of you, um, I'm a very shy person, so I find myself a lot at events where um, I like go and don't talk to anyone and go home. <laughs> um, and some of you here know a lot of people and then some of you don't. So if you see people that seem like maybe they would like uh, to talk or you know are 
perhaps don't know someone here, you could just say hello and introduce yourself. Um, and I think if we all try to do that today, then maybe there'll be less shy people like me being like, oh, I failed that event. Um, <laughs> so that was just, I'm sure we all know this. I think that's so much about the spirit of this community is like reaching out, but I just wanted to say that explicitly. All right. So we have two pieces left for our introduction. The first piece is what happened in 2018 with an exclamation mark that we were, we were really excited to share with you right now. And then the next piece is what are we planning to do in 2019 that we're really thrilled to, to share with you. So the first thing is welcome Dorothy. Oh my gosh, I told Ben earlier, I'm such a crier and I'm very emotional, but um, I just wanted to say hello and thank you so much. And I guess it's my opportunity to say that one of the reasons why I am so passionate about the community is because when people ask me what I do, I always say, I want to be what I needed. And the one community that I feel that I see that models that is the community that's here today and around the world. And, you know, it's just, I remember, and I told Ben this funny story of when I first met Casey and I said, wow, you're Casey Rees. And then he just looked at me, smiled, and I said, oh, you know who you are. <laughs> and then years later, and then, you know, working with Dan and Lauren and Ben and Joanna um, and Casey is has been just a pleasure. And um, I don't, I'm, I'm really not, I, I don't, I'm so beside myself saying this, but this is the best job I've ever had. And I think it's so meaningful to be here today with all of you, and I can't wait to, um, talk to you about your projects and learn more from you because you will be teaching me and that's a part of my job as program manager. So thank you. And then, yeah, that brings up a really good point that the other person not sitting up here is Johanna Hedva who's our director of advocacy and she'll be, she'll be here the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the next thing on our 2018 list, Lauren. Okay, so this is the section where we talk about cool things that happened, and one of those is um, the launch of the P5JS web editor. Do you have? Um, so Cassie Tarakajian led the development of that and continues to lead it. It was a project that was several years in the making. Um, yeah, that's Cassie. She's wonderful. Um, she's not here today, um, but do you have the slide of the editor? Yeah. So the whole idea was that rather than having to download something or set up a project, you could just go to the browser and start coding. Um, and it's up, it's live, it's re we've really seen it kind of like take off in terms of usage. And then another thing I'm really excited about is um, the work we put into accessibility features. So you can actually use this uh, with a screen reader if you can't see the screen. Um, and we're continuing to develop it. The next thing is the processing Pi documentation, but Gottfried actually just walked up the stairs. No, he's coming. He's coming back. Good morning. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm, my name is Gottfried Heide, um, and the reason why I'm up here is that, um, that uh, in a, what seems like a million years ago, I once contributed um, some code to make processing. <laughs> Uh, run on the Pi and on ARM devices. Um, you're welcome. Um, and I'm happy to share with you that um, kind of like this year um, we had um, Max Sergei um, work on a website for that. And, um, uh, and not only a website, but also like a couple of tutorials, um, which um, I mean the idea behind the project was to make it sort of like more straightforward um, to get going on on the Pi and on, on small devices. And I think um, that's a big step forward. Um, <coughs> um, I wanna say like real brief, a little bit more um, things more general about, um, about the project. I don't think there is anything particularly interesting about the Pi or about processing on the Pi. <laughs> um, besides maybe the fact um, that it is a model of a system uh, of, in which basically all parts of the stack are uh, free software and open source. 
So as you know, the, the Pi not only runs your sketch, but underneath the sketch runs processing, and underneath the processing um, runs a Linux distribution. And uh, for me, the interesting thing is, just to think about it as a model, is that behind every level of the stack, you have communities, and you have communities like this one. Um, you have people who write code, um, who help troubleshoot issues, who help maintain um, pieces of infrastructure that we normally don't really think about. Um, and they've been maintaining this sort of like for years and years. And to me, sort of like the more interesting part of a project like this or even engaging with that is sort of like the question of how we as sort of like as artists, as designers, can learn to be sort of like better citizens, better neighbors in such sort of like a, a gift economy. And um, yeah, that's, that's my two thoughts. Um, I'm really excited about PCD, and um, thanks for everyone. Thanks everyone for making this happen. Um, okay, so we had a couple really exciting translation efforts happen this year, this past year. So we launched um, the P5JS website in Spanish, and also a copy. Oh. Yeah, and also a copy of the um, Getting Started with P5JS book in Spanish. And I just wanted to give a shout out to a couple of people that, that are here. Taeyun Choi did the illustrations for the book and then rewrote all the um, text parts in Spanish for this one. Um, <laughs> and Tyler Yin, where's Tyler? Yeah, back there, um, did the book layout and book design. And then additionally, we launched a little bit, a few months later, the Chinese translation of the book, or sorry, of the website. Um, this effort was led by one of our fellows, Kenneth Lim, with a lot of help from Chen Chen Ye, who's here today. Chen Chen, are you here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, she also made this awesome background animation, which is not currently animated, but you can see it on the website. Okay, uh, uh, the next thing that uh, I'm going to talk about is something called Google Summer of Code. I didn't prepare to figure out who on this slide is here today. Is anybody who, whose face is up here here? If it is, you'd be bold and stand up. <laughs> Maybe not, okay, that was, a, that was a little bit of a failed moment there. But these are a wonderful collection of students who worked on uh, Google Summer of Code. It's a program that Google funds, that process, the Processing Foundation has been lucky enough to participate in for, for uh, several, ye many years now. Uh, we will apply again for Google Summer of Code 2019. It is a, a wonderful way that we can bring new uh, energy and people into the project. Um, if you are a current student, undergraduate, or graduate student um, anywhere in the world, and you are uh, a student this year, even if you graduate this year, you are eligible to apply. If you don't need to have some sort of like expert, open source, developing knowledge thing, please, anyone is welcome, all beginners, uh, um, are welcome to apply to contribute to Google Summer of Code with processing. So stay tuned for more information about that, assuming that Google selects us again to be an organization for this summer, because that, that is sort of pending. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and then one other thing we did this year was to relaunch the processing forums, now the processing discourse. So we've been through uh, five different pieces of forum software since 2002, um, always trying to make that better. You know, the web changes quickly. Um, I'm really excited about the, the launch and the start of this. We have some really um, wonderful moderators who are now participating, um, and I think that the, the forum as a way for contributors to communicate with each other is, is off on a, a new good footing. Dorothy. Hello. Me again, Dorothy. I, so I am going to talk a little bit very briefly about each of our 2018 fellows so here is Ari's project. Ari worked on Justice Factory, and it is an interactive data visualization tool that highlights social justice issues and human rights violations. And then Kate, Katie, and Tom joined forces and created four chapters of an open source project-based textbook using processing to deliver advanced placement computer science material. Saber developed an education outreach program to support K-12 educators, as well as bring the Creative Coding Fest to more community members. Kirit worked on 
renovating the processing.org website. George and George, uh, he worked on a pilot of his organization's ambitious program, SUA Code, which is an online course to teach millions across Africa how to code via their smartphones. And as Lauren brought up, Kenneth provided a translation of the p5.js website and documentation into Chinese. And then Matura and Luis worked on P5 a P5 accessibility library for blind and visually impaired users. And finally, we have Vijith, who worked on a P5.js code repository as an editorial project. So everyone can see across the fellows that such a diverse range of um, projects that we've supported this past year. So here we are, it's 2019. <laughs> So I think the question is, what can we do together this year? What can we do to work together, to make new tools, to develop new community, et cetera? We have some ideas. We're going like, to jumpstart with that, but hopefully we'll have a lot of conversations about this today. So me again. Hi. So the 2019 uh, fellowships, we just finished reviewing the applications. And I know everyone says this, you know, it was a difficult process. It really is because the community itself, when we were reading through the submissions, it's really indicative of how passionate the community members are to develop new ideas, work on exciting projects, work in realms that they've never worked in before. And so we have finished our selection process. That announcement will be going out very soon. So stay tuned. This is we almost, 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 almost finished. Not finished yet. Sorry. Um, I think I'm getting anxious because I'm just like, oh gosh. Anyway, but um, so look out for that. That's 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 a you know for cliffhanger. So stay tuned because it's exciting. I'm excited. So get excited. Okay. Yeah. Dan. <laughs> slide to tell me what I'm talking about. No, I'm just kidding. I remember. Okay, so um, you just saw um, his face uh, uh, as one of the um, 2018 uh, fellows, and we're really excited to welcome Saber Khan to the uh, Processing Foundation team as the director of education ed community director. Education community director. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, um, it's been interesting. I started uh, in 2003 with um, l with uh, writing tutorials for processing because somebody uh, somehow signed me up to teach a class with processing, and I thought, oh, I better write some tutorials for this. And that was in the context of a graduate school environment. And it's been kind of amazing to see over the years the different kinds of communities that have adopted processing um, and, p and, and, p and uh, Python processing and uh, ra the Raspberry Pi processing and, and P5.js. And in particular, one thing that I've noticed uh, over the last couple years is how um, K through 12 education and students across all younger ages are learning to code and that the, the processing community and the way of being and thinking and philosophy has something to contribute there. So um, beyond uh, we've always been in this place in between art and computer science. We've always been something that's um, an environment that we try to take a, a beginner, like that consider beginners and learners and education as a priority. And so we're really excited to try to formalize that more and have somebody on our team who's dedicated to that with a, a set of goals like a processing foundation education portal and uh, more events and types of outreach to teachers who are in many ways the uh, pr our primary users that we haven't always had the best communication with. So that's something exciting that I hope we will expand through the work that Saber and his uh, background and knowledge will bring to the Processing Foundation. Um, and we've been really excited about some of the support we've gotten for this work this year. So the Knight Foundation um, gave us a grant to develop this idea of Node Cities, which will be part of what Saber is working on. And what it means to us right now is um, an attempt to think more about local organizing. So right now, a lot of um, what we're doing ends up happening in cities like LA or New York, and we really want to reach outside of that and connect with people um, there that are interested in getting involved in organizing things. Um, so more on that coming this year. And then finally, um, P5.js, we had some exciting news that we got some support from Mozilla. Um, so that means a few things for us. One, first of all, we're going for a 1.0 release. <laughs> Um, 
six years in, so um, t I wanted to call out a few people. Um, Evelyn Masso and Stalja Grigg are going to be taking a um, big role in P5JS, working towards that this year. You guys want to wave? Yeah. Um, and Kate Hollenbach is another person that's been um, kind of involved with the project with the project for a while. Yeah, you want to? Yeah. Um, and she helped us, I think it was her suggestion at the start um, when she was working on it this past year and just said like, what do you think about having a roadmap for this project? Um, and that just set off all sorts of ideas. So we're following up on that. Um, and then lastly, we're planning a contributors conference that's gonna happen in um, August. And we've got a cool team of organizers and one of them he is here, Carlos Garcia. You here? Yeah, right here. Um, so stay tuned, there'll be a, um, more announcements about that coming up later this year. That's the beginning, or the end of the beginning. Um, we're so excited to be here with you today and we're gonna turn it over to Shen to, to kick off uh, the day in, in full. Thank you very much. So hello everyone. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Processing Community Day, Los Angeles. Uh, I, my name is Xing Xing. I am the lead organizer and director for the event and uh, the troublemaker too <laughs> for the event. And um, I, I just want to thank everyone for being here and, and joining this um, event with us, especially the, the track coordinators, Processing Foundation Board, and also um, all the conference guests who have been working really hard on making this happen, as well as volunteers and, and, and different kind of staffs that we have today that I will go into a little bit. Um, and also thank you for, for people who are attending and interested enough to, to check out what is going to happen today. Um, so, I am going to try to keep it brief and sort of just run through what is gonna happen today and what's the structure. If anything, anything seems confusing, I'll try to answer them. So feel free, if you have any question at any time, just, just shout out a question or, or raise your hand, like whatever you prefer, and, and I'll try to look out for that and answer your questions. And also feel free to come to me one-on-one -on -one afterward. So um, as you can see, this is our, our Twitter um, handle and that's the hashtag if, if you are thinking of tweeting or um, doing anything on social media related to the event um, or find content, that's, that's kind of the lead for that. So talking a little bit about intention, um, processing Community Day Los Angeles is, is for me really a deeper reflection on what inclusivity means. Um, so when I was invited to organize this event, um, Processing Community Day, I started by thinking about what, what is processing community, right? Like who is in the processing community, who is not, and how do we, so I'm gonna lower this a little bit, how do we distinguish those lines or are those lines um, blurry? Like how, how do I form a program that's going to um, make sense for the processing community. And, and my, my sort of result of like thinking, thinking across those questions is that I don't necessarily think that 
only people who can use processing or have learned processing can be in the processing community or even you know people who want to learn processing or know about processing I think we should uh, at least for me like this event I'm, I'm taking a very expensive approach of community and instead I want to maybe start thinking about what it means to be more inclusive and with the word inclusivity, are, are we including people who don't seem to be part of us or is it the other way around? Or is it kind of a constant struggle and constant sort of trials and errors of see, figuring out how, how do we talk, how do we like share from our references and how do we break down, break down maybe um, languages or jargons so, so that we can better understand each other and better communicate ourselves and, and see what kind of collaboration can happen from that. Um, so with those in mind, um, the program turned into this um, sort of very broad theme of art and code and activism. And, and these three words are very broad and, and very general, generalizing to, to call it that way, but we, we shoot out an open call and, and just wanted to see you know, what kind of people would be interested in participating and what kind of content can we get and, and just kind of let, let it grow organically a little bit without having like a very enforced structure of how it should be. So, so thus, um, we have the program that we have today. If you, the best way to um, understand the program structure is to like take a look at the, the printed program. And if you haven't received this, you can get, you should be able to get one at the registration desk. So throughout the day, in the beginning portion of the day, we are going to all be in this room just like now. And after this section ends, um, we are gonna break into four different theme tracks. So these four different theme tracks are under the Silicon the Beach, accessibility, disability, and care, radical pedagogy, and epic play. These four tracks would run continuously and simultaneously throughout the whole day. And, and as a participant, uh, you would need to kind of like plan out your own day, like how, choose your own adventure, how, how would you like to plan your day, and how would you like to figure out, you know, like things that you might be already interested in, but also things that you might just be curious about but don't know much about. So, so that's um, the idea. When, when Lauren brought up that um, you know, we should all try to talk to people that we haven't met or haven't gone to school with. I think that's, that's really also part of like, a big like, goal for, for the programming of this event. Like how, how can we find more creative and playful way to talk to each other? And how can we um, maybe stop thinking about our personal training or discipline or job a little bit and, and just see what, what is what else can happen with, with the open source ethos and what else can, what kind of collaboration can happen between coders and non-coders, for instance, or artists. And, and so with that in mind, I also want to mention there are two new sessions that's happening during lunch break. And, and one is intro to open source for coders and non-coders. And the idea for that is, is really, you know, there's gonna be lunch set out here, take lunch box and, and just go and, and have this like very laid back, relaxed um, session. And, and there's also another session called the, the open lab during lunch. This is where if you have, if you're working on an existing project um, with code, um, and you have, you have like questions or you, you need help debugging or you just want to work on it, um, this is where you can go. It's, it's just like kind of like a coding hangout. So that's happening too, and that's all on the schedule. And during lunch break, we would also like to encourage people to propose your own topic of discussion. Uh, we kind of purposefully didn't include um, Q and A's for all the lightning talks because Q and A's can be a little bit awkward, especially with like 120 other people. And, <laughs> and we want this to kind of grow more organically. So after the speaker talk, please, like if you have a question, like just, just go up, introduce yourself and, and start chatting. And if, if the question becomes, you know, if the discussion becomes interesting, maybe you can propose a topic. So we're gonna have yard signs <laughs> available out front. And during lunch, you can propose a topic like this topic discussion and, and just stick it into the lawn and have lunch out there and, and please go around and see what kind of discussion topics there are and like join people's circle. 
So, so that's, that's one possibility for organizing something on your own. And also we have these like show and tell stations on the second floor and there are sign up sheets there. So if you wanna share a project, screen based or not, it doesn't, there's, it's not medium specific. Um, you, can, you can go up there and just put your name in and, and be there to, to present your work. And also there is another thing called the community lightning talk that's happening today at 4.30. So a community open mic, um, which is an opportunity to give a five minute lightning talk, if you like. And this is meant to, the, the reason why it's called open mic is because it's meant to be very casual. Like it's meant to be like laid back and casual. It's not, it doesn't have to be highly well prepared. It's more just, hey, wanna know what, what you're thinking or what you're working on, come share with us. And, and that part, I should note, is going to take place here. And it's also going to be live streamed as part of the, the, the streaming program. And yes, um, we will have um, an after party after the reception away from campus in Westwood at this place called Thunderbird. It's on Wilshire, there's an address here. So, so that's going to ha happen at 6.30. Um, and that's, that's not here, so we, we will like slowly move out to, to the other location. All right, so I would like to just um, introduce the theme tracks a little more. Each theme track is uh, coordinated by a group of like really wonderful people. Um, so for accessibility, disability, and care, it's Kayun Choi and Johanna Hedba. And for radical pedagogy, it's A.M. Dark and Dorothy Santos. And for Under the Silk on the Beach, it's Tiga Brain and Sam Levine. And for Epic Play is Chandler McWilliams. So if you have any question regarding things that's happening within those tracks, like those, you know, feel free to talk to those people. And I'm, now I'm gonna invite uh, each group of them to, to come up and say a little bit about their track. So Taeyun. Hi, my name is Taeyun. So I want to start by thanking Sinsin because I was the organizer for the first Processing Community Day um, two years ago, and I just know how much work it is. <laughs> and I feel like Sin just took it to the next level, and with Dorothy and Johanna made it global as well, which is just so, such a significant um, moment for this project. And I thank you for bringing everybody and inviting me to organize. And um, I'm an artist and I'm an educator from the School for Poetic Computation. And I will be leading and um, facilitating a session called Accessibility, Disability, and Care with Johanna Heba. An idea here is that code can be a medium that does not pe uh, discriminate people. We can use code to talk to people who are blind or people who are deaf or have different uh, ways of learning and engaging with the world. I've been using processing to engage with different disability communities for the past four years. Use it uh, with the processing and P5JS, and um, Claire kearney Borlt, who's also here, has been using it for different kinds of accessibility features. And it's, it's very powerful when you can connect with people who you think you don't share very much. It's people you feel like you can't communicate because they don't speak language or they just um, work in different ways. But you use code to collaborate, and you can use code to give platform for their voice to be amplified. So that's the point where disability meets processing community. And accessibility means it's empowering those who don't have access to those tools and resources and including them in the process of designing. So some of the workshop breakout sessions are about participatory design processes or community building across different abilities. And lastly, the care part. I think code is powerful because it gives form to uh, abstract ideas. And code is it's, it's just a magical tool where you can express yourselves. But more than just 
it's, it's more than just building technologies or machines. It's really about creating this safe space, a habitat for your creativity to take place and also for you to meet with other people. And the code of conduct, as well as attention to details about what makes people comfortable and how they can care for one another is core to what I think is special about processing and its community. So please come to our learning talks and workshops and I look forward to meeting you all. Nice to meet you. All right, and the next track is Under the Silicon the Beach by Tiga Brain and Sam Levine. Uh, hi, I'm Sam Levine. And I'm Tiga. Um, and we just want to start actually by acknowledging the, the teachers' strike that's happening here in LA and express our solidarity for that movement. Um, but our track, called Under the Silicon the Beach, is a riff on the situationist slogan that emerged in the French student protests of 1968. I will uh, save you from my French, but it translates to under the pavement, the beach. Um, and protesters wrote this phrase all around the streets of Paris, referring to the sand or the beach that lies just underneath the pavement stones. And they were using these stones to like build up barricades and throw, the, throw, the, throw them and defend themselves from the police. <laughs> um, so figuratively, this phrase uh, refers to the potential for um, disruption and repurpose um, that lies right beneath the surface of everyday, you know, utilitarian, utilitarian, utilitarian uh, infrastructure. Um, and today, of course, software is infrastructure. And at a moment where software tools and platforms, especially those online, um, have become increasingly centralized, increasingly privatized, um, creative practices and open source toolkits have never been more important for both undermining the present uh, and developing an imagination um, for al alternative futures. So in Under the Silicon the Beach, we're asking the question, how can we find the beach underneath all of this silicon? Thank you. And Radical Pedagogy with AM Dark and Dorothy Santos. Hi, my name is A.M. Dark. I am an artist and a game designer, and uh, as of uh, September, I am new faculty at UC Santa Cruz within uh, Art and Design, Games, and Playable Media. Thank you, thank you. Um, this is also, I'm already feeling so nostalgic because I went to UCLA. I have spent so much time in this building. I went to the DMA program. Casey Reese was one of my mentors, one of the very first people who invested in me. And I did this, oh gosh, I think it was like seven years ago. I am a first generation student, a college student. I am, was a transfer student, non-traditional, older. Um, I came here as an undergrad and went here for two years. And then I went in the same program, uh, I went to grad school here back to back. It was very intense, uh, four years, as you might imagine. And standing in front of you, I think so much. My first class here was interactivity with Casey. And I learned a lot. I'm still kind of a crappy coder, sorry Casey. But <laughs> what I really got out of that experience was that sense of um, being seen, um, having my intelligence and ability reinforced, being told that I had value and that I was capable even when I would you know, profusely apologize and thank him for staying a little bit late with me or spending a little bit extra time. I'm so grateful for the many times that and not so many words, Casey would tell me I was being stupid. But by telling me that, you know, you can do this, I'm staying here with you because of the effort you're putting in, not because, you know, there's something wrong here, you don't have to apologize. And so I really appreciate that, and I really love the spirit here today. I've been uh, live tweeting the session, I'm saying, hey, I hope that y'all can hear all of the kids in the background and hear the families and hear the sense of joy and comfort and how this is about this is not about the tech, it's about the community. And so um, I'm really proud and, and happy to be here today. Um, my idea of radical pedagogy is essentially about vulnerability and being human um, and bringing your full self. An example of this is that uh, not only am I the track coordinator, but about three days ago, I became one of the speakers. 
And I thought, oh no, oh no, what do I do? And I said, you know, this is gonna be fine because some of the best pedagogical practices I've developed have come out of a sense of urgency and out of a sense of not being able to doubt myself and having to just stand in front of people and say, you know what, we're gonna wing it and we're gonna do it together and we're gonna figure it out and it's gonna be great. And uh, so far I've been doing that at UC Santa Cruz and it's wonderful and I think, you know, Radical pedagogy is all about modeling this idea of process over perfection, about bringing your full self to spaces in which you teach, whatever that looks like, and by doing so, inviting others, inviting the people that you're in collaboration with to bring their full selves, and not worry so much about performing expertise, but going through the process of experimentation and learning and doing such without anxiety. We can have our anxiety but you know, let it sit on a shelf somewhere and just show up and try things because it's, because it's fun and it's enjoyable and you know, opening that up to community. So that's my idea about radical pedagogy. And when I say teaching, you do not have to be a formal educator. Most of the things that I have learned uh, have been by following people I enjoy on Twitter or Instagram. You know, my inspiration for teaching are teenage girls who are using Instagram to, to make you know, cheat sheets about how to make friends, how to get the perfect cat eye, which thank you 13 year olds because like it's on point. <laughs> this is what I'm inspired by. So there are so many people that do emotional labor and do work within social justice circles and um, within uh, open source communities who are just saying this is what I learned as I'm learning it and this is my process and want to put it out there for anybody else to latch onto and then, and then grow and spread from there. So, yeah, radical pedagogy. Thank you. An epic play by Chandler McWilliams. Hi everyone, um, I was asked to keep this on the short side, which is fine. Uh, so my track is Epic Play, um, and the idea here was that uh, I have two young kids, being a father is a big part of my self-understanding, and I wanted to find a way to bring families into this event, um, but also a way to um, kind of widen a conversation about what play means. Uh, similar to what Lauren was saying about how we use software, we take it for granted, uh, I feel like increasingly we do that with the concept of play. Um, play has become cited onto game consoles, onto sports fields, occasionally into cards and boards if we're lucky. Um, but I think play is really something that exists throughout the world and that if we work together we can find ways to open up little points that we can prize open uh, to play in every day. And that the important thing about play is that when we're playing we're not working and we're always expected to work all the time. So. If we can find ways to play more, then we'll also be working less. So, thank you. Okay, I'm going to quickly cover the Processing Community Day support so that we can get into a coffee break. Um, first of all, there's a code of conduct that is also at the registration desk that everyone should have a copy of. Please take a look. Um, it's very generously compiled by Dorothy Santos. And um, so thank you, Dorothy. And please take a look of it and just make sure that um, the, the guideline is understood. And the second support we have is child care. So we have a child care giver who is on the third floor. If you open the program on the map, um, you would see the location of child care on the third floor, so, so please, there's also signs on the door, so if you need childcare, please um, let one of our volunteers know and, and we'll help you out and, and, and introduce you um, to, to the caregiver. And there's also, obviously, um, the, the live captioning is happening and that is so exciting and wonderful to organize. Um, there's a chill room on the third floor as well, close to the childcare room, and that is for if you ever feel like you need time to just kind of relax or take a breather. It's, it's a small <coughs> library, so you can just um, be there and it should be maintained as a quiet space. Um, also, there is a gender neutral bathroom, and that is 
um, if you walk out of here, um, facing towards the right side, you would see a play card, a stand, and there's um, just signs, follow the sign, and, and you should be able to find it. And if not, just, just get one of the volunteers. There are two um, communication channels created for this event. Um, those are signal groups where um, one is for POC to communicate and meet each other and also share experiences. And the second one is um, the queer safe space. The first one is facilitated by, by Tristan Espinoza. So I wanna give a round of applause for him. And, and the second one is facilitated by Evelyn Masso in the back. We have um, quite a few of youth and children friendly sessions. So, so if you see the program after the title, whatever that says 12 plus is, is youth friendly. If it says five plus, it means it's, it's also children friendly. And yes, have a great time. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so we're running a little bit over time. Let's take a quick five minute coffee break and, and moving to the next session. Thank you.
for lat foo zero foo bar hello Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. Ah, now we're here. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay, I'll say hello. Right. Hi, hi, everyone. We're going to get started now. So this is the lightning talks for Under the Silicon, the Beach, and Tika is going to introduce each of the uh, our, our wonderful presenters. We're as as was mentioned before, we're not doing Q and A after the uh, talks, but you can go and 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 just introduce yourselves uh, kind of on an individual basis to the speakers afterwards. Uh, so I'll just quickly um, introduce you to all the speakers um, up the front and then we'll jump straight into the talks. Our first presentation is the resistance of everyday objects. This is going to be from Rumi Morrison. Rumi's an interdisciplinary designer, artist and researcher working across human geography and digital technology and urbanism. And their, focus, focus, their practice focuses on dissolving fixed understandings of race and geography and they're currently a PhD fellow at USC. Following Rumi, we have Cynthia X. Hua, who will present The Voice in the Machine. Cynthia is a researcher and artist working with artificial intelligence and algorithmic technologies in the context of culture, identity, and economy. Then Incant Incantation with Code by Lark VCR. Lark VCR, AKA Virtually Conflicted Reality, explores multiplicity of meaning and experience in an increasingly digitized world, nudging at dissolving boundaries between body and machine. And they are currently teaching at Carter Digital Media Art Program at San Jose State University. Limitation as Poetry will be presented by Stagia Grigg. Stagia is an artist, educator, and activist based here in LA, exploring how revolutionary impulses move through culture and also is a UCLA alum. And finally, Simulating Surveillance by Peter Pollock. Peter is a game designer and developer. His research looks at algorithms and representation and how these shape capacities for critique and organizing. And he is also a PhD fellow here in Information Studies at UCLA. So let's give everybody a warm welcome. And we'll um, start off with Rumi, thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah, there we go. Good. <laughs> so thank you for that introduction. Uh, I feel really grateful to be here, both because I find these things really deeply terrifying, um, but also because I think it's helpful to be forced into a kind of vulnerability. Um, as has already kind of been uh, said earlier today and just kind of setting the tone for the space, this is really going to be an overview of a few things that I'd like us to kind of think about and consider. Uh, it's not going to be complete or authoritative, so please come and speak to me after I'm done talking. Ask questions. If there are things you disagree with, we can have like a really fruitful debate. Whatever your response is, like, please come and engage with me. Um, so just to give you a little bit more background about myself, uh, I was trained in urban design and architecture uh, and have like a big love for maps and for space. Trying to transition slides, which don't seem like they're working. Anyone? The aesthetics of data visualization, linear trajectory. And so it's kind of it's really effusive. It's something uh, sort of desire to make something known or discreet is always the objective. I think there's something that is really fruitful in what can be clandestine or what moves kind of underneath the surface. 
and so a lot of my work now is really trying to investigate a kind of politics of unknowability as something that can be generative and productive. Um, and so a lot of my past work was dealing with issues of racial violence within space, particularly historic and systemic racial violence within space. Uh, like I said, my background is in working with maps and geospatial data. So I had done a lot of projects around redlining, um, the ways that race is kind of epidermalized and fixed to the body, and then the ways that bodies are fixed into spaces due to public policy largely, um, that works as a kind of dispossessive force, either extracting labor or removing value from particular spaces and cities. Um, and redlining maps are a kind of a very discrete example of this. So literally the red areas on the map were the areas where you could look at census data and see that black people and new immigrants lived. And this was most consistently the metric that was used to assign risk to something like race. Um, and in working and doing a lot of this uh, work in the past, the redlined areas kind of take on their own narrative as well. They take on a narrative of dispossession and it kind of does this unintended, there's this unintended consequence of kind of associating or naturalizing blackness is something that's objection in the narratives that we tell about redlining and in the ways that we visualize the data to try and meaningfully uh, intercede and interject uh, new ways of thinking about racialized violence and how to represent it. So in trying to use data and trying to use maps as the kind of tool uh, to kind of meaningfully engage in these histories, it almost does a disservice in that it essentializes those red areas as only sites of dispossession, um, as only sites of abjection, as only sites of violence, and then therefore kind of naturalizes those bodies to only being the victims of violence and not having their own responses as well. Uh, so this was a project that was trying to trouble a lot of that tension. Um, the project was kind of geographically situated in Boston and was trying to chart the ways that groups of black feminists, particularly the Kambahi River Collective, was organizing around Boston by kind of adaptively reusing this devalued housing stock. Uh, and kind of reappropriating it into a network of safe homes for black women at the time. And so we were playing with like some stereoscopic printing to basically take the contours of the data, the actual shape files um, of those redlined areas in Boston, to scale them down and then to really flood the image with them, kind of making the case that if we only continue to try and understand the narratives of what happened in Boston and redlining through the data alone and through the shape files, then it obscures being able to see and understand what the land is underneath. Right? Um, and so then the cyan layer, the layer that you would see if you're using those little like decoder lenses, uh, basically tells the story of the kind of spatial mobilization of the Kambahi River Collective, again, reappropriating this housing stock that had been devalued due to redlining, and then putting it into a social technical, technical network as a series of safe homes for black women at the time in Boston. So it's trying to play with the tensions between those two layers and hopefully get to a kind of third space that's outside of this binary between what's fixed and discrete and then what's kind of wildly fluid and effusive, kind of coming back to the dichotomy between those two maps that we looked at. Uh, and I think this quote by Catherine McKittrick is really great at kind of synthesizing a lot of the concerns that I had about the use of maps and the use of data. Um, I'm gonna read it because I think it's actually worth saying it out loud. Uh, so many analyses of racial and spatial violence rely heavily on describing and re-describing spaces of absolute otherness, as well as the inhabitants of these spaces of otherness. It logically follows, because they are dead and dying, the condemned and without apparently have nothing to contribute to our broader intellectual project of ethically reimagining our ecocidal and genocidal world. Right, so McKittrick is really trying to bring our attention, again, to these unintended consequences, of what it means to want to meaningfully analyze the racial violence within space and <coughs> accidentally kind of naturalizing, again, uh, the sort of inhabitants or the the subjects of violence as being non-essential to having any of their own episteme or any of their own knowledge set to address some of those violences. Uh, what it also kind of does is that it relegates the tools of like geospatial information processing, mapping, um, as being these kind of like large scale solutions for then trying to intercede into these problems and then negates any kind of grounded, interpersonal, socially imbued responses as well, right? It kind of negates all of those things and makes them, again, kind of unknowable. Um, so Catherine's work, and particularly uh, this article, which I implore you all to read, on plantations, prisons, and a black sense of place, has really crafted, I think, a new direction in my work in thinking about what the limitations, the kind of politics, um, and the underlying assumptions are with regards to the tools that we use and the kind of methods that we try to employ. And so this meant really trying to shift out of a like overtly analytical lens into something that is admittedly a lot more unwieldy. 
um, looking at different types of epistemologies and ways of knowing that are not centered within the encapsulation of data and like formal analysis. Uh, and I'd like to say that I came to rituals out of a kind of epiphany of like intellectual wonder, but that's really not true. Um, my investigation of thinking about rituals came at a time when I was in a lot of transition. Uh, so this past summer, I was at an artist residency in New Orleans and simultaneously preparing to move here from New York to start a PhD program. I recently had my heart broken by someone that I really loved and was now in this, <laughs> in this artist residency trying to figure out what I was gonna do. Um, and ritual became something that came out of necessity, really. Um, and a necessity to have a kind of routine, a kind of consistent practice that allows you to weather the kind of flux, change, um, and really like lack of control of the external world, right? So ritual became its kind of knowledge structure to respond to flux, to respond to change that you have no control over. Um, and so more specifically, I started wanting to ground ritual and different histories of a radical black tradition primarily different rituals that contain both the production of media objects as well as the grounding of those objects in kind of social technical systems for creating circulation. Um, and so the Negro Motors Green Book is a huge inspiration in doing so. Uh, there are a series of travel guides, quote unquote, that were first produced by a gentleman named Victor H. Green who was a retired, retired mailman working out of Hackensack, New Jersey. And basically he started publishing them in 1934 and stopped publishing them in 19, 1965. And essentially they started listing city by city, state by state, all the kind of quotidian everyday spaces that would cater or serve black people at the height of Jim Crow. Uh, so things like hotels, motels, like bars, lounges, sometimes individual homeowners would put their homes in the book as a kind of temporary guest house. And this became a way not just to mark like safe spaces, but it became a way to understand the real landscape and the way that the landscape of the US is inherently racialized and then to be able to navigate it. Um, and so it does this work of looking at everyday sites and then kind of puts them into this network and allows them to become somewhat phenomenological and emergent. Um, and the other thing that's particularly interesting about the guidebook is really how it's circulated. So Victor H. Green, as I said, was a retired mailman, and he basically uses his contacts within the Postal Workers Union to get in contact with black mail workers who are walking their routes throughout the US. They're taking notes about the spaces that, again, cater to black people, um, and then they're kind of recirculating all those notes back to Victor H. Green, who's compiling them and then sending them back out in circulation. So from the 1930s to the 1960s, Victor H. Green is essentially hacking the US Postal Service, uh, making a kind of crowdsourced mechanism for allowing for the safe transportation of black people across space that they're not supposed to be transgressing, right? So again, kind of decoupling the ways that race is essentialized to bodies and that geogra geography becomes fixed uh, based on that kind of logic, right? The logic of where black people are allowed to be or not be. And so one of the other things I wanted to turn to you are the, the freedom quotes. Uh, in a kind of similar vein, but a little bit different, the freedom quotes are basically a semiotic structure, like a, a structure of signage uh, embedded into actual quilts, mostly displayed in geometric patterns that were used to both mark spots along the Underground Railroad as well as to communicate pretty specific and kind of detailed information about space. Um, so as we can see here, these are kind of attempts by some academics in a really beautiful book called Hidden in Plain View, uh, trying to look at the semiotics of the symbols that are used and then extract the kind of meaning. Uh, so again, these were patterns that were stitched into quilts that would be hung on homes that were safe houses within the Underground Railroad, but that would commute lots of different types of information. Uh, so like the log cabin, which is the second from the right on the top row, is meant to communicate a kind of safe house or a sanctuary. Uh, the monkey wrench was a, again in that same row, but on the far left, is trying to detail that this is a place where you would need to gather tools for the survival ahead. Um, as well as others that are trying to say, this is the place where you need to kind of masquerade as a free person and to put on clean clothes, right? So it's pretty detailed, one, a really detailed understanding of space, communicated through the medium of the quilt itself, and then displayed throughout space to both mark safe houses and have a kind of live updating system about the politics of how race and space converge for people that are escaping slavery. And so in thinking about these things as ritual practice, I wanted to kind of test myself to work outside of the disciplines of formal, formal analysis, use of geospatial data, and then experiment with installation as a kind of form for what the data set can be. 
um, that's very much premised on ritual. And so appropriating the log cabin pattern, I wanted to return to some of my own rituals of protection and cohesion and to be able to layer installation uh, so that there are more multiple forms of reading. Uh, so what you're seeing is like a large quilt built into the structure of the freedom or of the log cabin, uh, made out of strips of newspaper. And the strips of newspaper are important because it dates back to another West African tradition of being able to ward off bad or evil spirits. The idea being that the written word was so sacred that even a spirit would have to honor it by trying to read it or decipher it. So if you were to cut it into strips and scramble it and line the inside of your home, evil spirits would have to try and scramble or decode that message before they could enter your house. So I wanted to both layer that on top of the semiotics of the log cabin, and then was playing with a lot of conductive material to make the, the quilt itself something that, that is a lot more effusive, that is alive. Um, so taking field recordings throughout New Orleans, uh, looping them, modulating them through Ableton, and then putting my own voice, remove my own voice on top of that, sort of as a meditation of my own practices of ritual and protection, made three experimental audio pieces that are then kind of stitched into the quilt as a soft circuit. So as you touch different parts of the quilt, you'll hear those field recordings of New Orleans, you'll hear my voice uh, kind of walking through my own patterns and rituals of protection, kind of layered on these older historic diasporic forms of again, moving across space and thinking about the context of race and space and needing protection. Um, and so this is really where a lot of my work is starting to go now in these kind of experimental forms to think through what the data set can potentially be. Again, grounded in a different kind of epistemology, one that's not so premised in discrete notions of data and analysis, but one that's rested a little bit more in the body, in social practice, um, and is rich in ritual as a very sophisticated, um, sort of like right into knowledge production in itself. And so the thing that I kind of want to close on is in the embrace of unknowability a little bit, it took a lot to transition from making admittedly strange maps into trying to make sound installations. But I think there's something really important about being honest about the limitations of the tools and the methods that you use. Um, there's a lot that can be done within them, but I think there's a lot that can be done in being honest again about what it doesn't allow you to do and to kind of be comfortable sitting in the discomfort of the unknown um, and pushing yourself into different methodological practices. So I think I'm over time, but I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Cynthia. should work now. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Cynthia. Nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today about a couple projects I've worked on that explore Asian identity and technology. Um, and thanks so much to the organizers for, for letting me chat about this stuff. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a writer and an artist, and I do a lot of installation art. Um, most of it explores either American identity or Asian identity. Um, so to start off today, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself, um, my life story. So that's this picture of me. I'm the, um, I'm the youngest one there. I'm four years old. Um, and I grew up in Nanjing, which is the southern part of China. And um, my father was assigned a job working in um, IT tech by the Chinese government. 
And eventually, a number of years later, in 1999, um, he got one of the many tech visas that were being given out to Chinese workers to work in Silicon Valley. So we moved to Fremont, California, um, and I was one of the many Asian families that immigrated to the US uh, to work in this industry. And um, part of the reason I, want, I wanted to explore Asian identity is because this is such a common story and so intertwined with the history of Silicon Valley. Um, so to start off with some background facts, this might be new to you, but um, Asians or Asian Americans actually constitute the majority of the tech workforce in Silicon Valley now. And um, this stat actually comes from 10 years ago. In 2010, um, Asian workers exceeded white workers in, um, in Bay Area tech corporations. Um, and back then, there were a lot of headlines, like now Asians suddenly outnumber white people in this industry. Um, and you can see the kind of the line chart over there is the, the growth over time. So 10 years ago is when, um, when the shift happened. Um, However, I think throughout my research, I've really found that this idea that technology is a majority Asian industry is often missing from the way that the tech industry is portrayed, either in media or in the public or um, even in the people who lead and are front-facing in companies. Um, so the Asian American Legal Defense Fund did this big study of how Asians in the tech industry were doing. And I think it spawned a few articles, like the Atlantic's article titled The Forgotten Minority. Um, but we have this, uh, this bar chart here. It, you probably can't read the text, but I'll just summarize it for you. The different lines represent different demographics, and it's showing um, gaps in executive parity, so the ratio between people who are at the top ranks of a company and lower level workers. And all the red lines are demographics for which the, uh, the parity is negative, so there's far more low level workers than executives. And the green lines are the ones for where there's much higher executives. So the only really top green line are for, for white men, which is at the, um, on the right of the chart. And you can see it's really astounding how much higher it is than the other demographics. And for me, I think what was even more striking is the fact that this study, this report came out at a time when there were actually more Asians and Asian Americans in lower level positions. So Asians were the majority of the workforce, and yet um, this executive, um, executive parity was still true. Um, so I started a project a couple months ago, it's called The Voice in the Machine, and I've been sitting down, because I have a bit of a journalistic background, I've been sitting down with a lot of Ama Asian Americans who work in the tech industry and interviewing them in both Mandarin and English. I'm hoping to do more languages with, um, with some assistance coming up, and asking them about, I, I wanted to talk sort of casually and generally, uh, just about their careers, their everyday lives, um, and I'm going to present some of the quotes I have from that coming up. Um, but before that, I wanted to talk about two other, two other uh, components of sort of Asian identity in the tech industry. One is Asian labor abroad, and people forget how much that feeds into Silicon Valley. So a lot of uh, electronic devices are more than 50 to 70 percent manufactured by East Asian labor. Um, I think Microsoft, I, uh, in a Washington Post article, was at 75 percent which is um, sort of a astounding because, of, because they're so often excluded from the narratives of these tech devices. Um, one fact that really strikes me is that the workers in China who work on creating Apple iPhones actually get paid less than what an Apple iPhone costs here. Um, and it's doubly ironic because part of the design of the Apple iPhone that Steve Jobs drew on was East Asian minimalism. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. And then the third component of sort of Asian identity and technology I've been thinking about is Sinofuturism, which is um, this trend where a lot of our Western ideas of what a future world looks like are heavily influenced by uh, this idea of a globalized, partially Asian-influenced scene. So here you have a lot of scenes from famous movies, Blade Runner, Firefly, Ghost in the Shell, um, and Part of the ways these movies communicate future is that they mix in a lot of Asian imagery and signage. Um, 
and a lot inspired by um, Chinatowns and East Asian megacities. And this is, a, this is a project I did, it's pictures kind of blurry, a while back where it was a, an AR drawing of Chinatown, except instead of words, um, I'd converted all the signage into scribbles because um, it was kind of the idea that when we see these, uh, these sino-futuristic futures, they're really made for an audience that the creators don't think will actually understand the language and is meant to convey a sort of strangeness. Anyways, um, I think I'm running short on time, but I wanted to share some excerpts from the interviews that, that I've been doing. Um, so here's one. I, I asked a person, and these are all conducted anonymously, um, how did you decide to go into the tech industry? And they said, it pays okay, it's a desk job. It's safe, and it's the job for a servant. Tech people are servers to the public and servers to the company. I find that tech people don't typically want to be leaders, and it's a job where you're most likely n not client-facing. It's kind of how Asian American cultures have been seen through history, kind of behind the scenes, quiet, put your head down, and do the work type of job. Um, and this wasn't the only person I talked to that expressed a similar sentiment. Another question I asked many people was, are you bothered by stereotypes of Asians in the tech industry? And um, someone said, um, I feel like many Asians choose to go into math, science, engineering because they're stable professions. And I, I know for a few of my friends who are foreign, it's easier to get a work visa in those careers. And it's also easier if you're an international student because math doesn't have language barriers. Ultimately, it's a choice we make, even though the choice is based on a lot of things we can't control. Um, and I asked them things you were to imagine um, a U.S. that was more equitable towards Asians and Asian Americans, what are some things that you would imagine? And um, here this person talked about how they wished more communication was done in Chinese and their native languages and how um, they went on to say how it was strange that they worked on a team that was majority foreign Asian, but that all the business communication within their large tech company was conducted in English, um, which is part of the reason I started conducting interviews in Mandarin, and I'm hoping to do other East Asian languages uh, in the future. And then the last thing, I, I asked them to talk about what they thought might make the world more equitable towards Asia and Asian Americans. And again and again, people said that they wanted more representation in movies and music and Asian artists. They wanted to have more images and more of a voice and be more front-facing. Um, so I think for me, that's part of the, the case for considering Asian identity more in, in the tech arts. Um, I've been doing, going to a lot of tech art festivals over the past couple years, and I think when we talk about identity in tech art, it so often becomes um, sort of everyone versus uh, like a predominant whiteness in, um, in that power structure. But I think it's also extremely important to remember what a large role Asian identity plays and I encourage anyone here who's Asian and Asian American, um, even if you're not an artist, to think about making art that kind of shares the narrative of how um, this culture and technology is intertwined. Um, that's, that's all I'm presenting today. Um, that's, that's me, if you wanna keep up with the project. Um, if you want to contribute to it or you think you have friends who might be interested in being interviewed, I'm doing interviews and collecting. There's also a form you can fill out for responses until the end of February. And the website is voice-machines.com. Um, so feel free to fill that out or pass that along to your friends. Um, I'm presenting some other, some like web poems. They're, they're also about Asian identity and technology in New York next month. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it from me. Thanks. Uh, 
happy to be here. I started learning how to code a couple of years ago through processing and P5, and I um, just have so much gratitude for this community for providing such um, a fun entry point into this world. So thank you, thank you. Oh, there's my thank you slide. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so I've always been uh, fascinated by divination tools online, um, especially how they translate such a physical embodied practice into virtual space. So this is free tarotreading.net where these cards, um, well they claim to have shuffled them once and then you can shuffle them again and it's like Ch -ch -ch -ch, and they visually shuffle them for you. Um, the I Ching online where the coins are these animated gifts um, and that ad, I love that ad. Uh, so I began questioning, you know, is this divination happening because of something magical in the code's execution? Is it happening because um, we believe it's happening, both? Um, someone or a few people have said that code could never be queered because um, it's based in a binary, which I don't totally agree with. I think it's interesting to think about what happens in the space between ones and zeros, what's opened up in that um, vast unknown. Um, and what we believe is possible. So the question that I've been exploring is, what is the possibility for computation when it comes to the unknown? Uh, this is a project called Tramagachi. It explores the potential for healing magic online. It's a spin on um, the virtual pet Tamagotchi. It's a collaboration with Porpentine Charity Heartscape who wrote the text for the piece and on the Tramagotchi website, you can log in and create a Tramagotchi, which is a virtualization of your trauma that then hangs out in cyberspace, you know, chilling, um, processing your trauma 24 seven. So I believe. Um, so this is all built in P5 and the website accesses your webcam and creates the skin of your Tramagotchi through your virtual shadow. Then you can decide what shape you want it to be, assign it a processor and charms. And after it's created, you can log in and much in the style of a virtual pet, care for your Tamagotchi by feeding, resting, or bathing it, but in sometimes strange ways. In central to the Tamagotchi's life in cyberspace is this deep in the machine world trauma compost shrine, where there are currently 427-ish Tramagotchi that have been created by people in the last six months circling this sign. And you can create one at Tramagotchi.com. And in the background of this, there is um, literally magic spells executing in the code which uh, we achieve by writing very practical, <laughs> legible code, and then using Babel, um, a JavaScript compiler to translate it, which has been a little buggy. Um, hold on, it's a little tricky with these video slides. So ideally, it would look something like this, um, which ended up not being quite possible because it was a really big endeavor and the code turned into somewhat of a beast. Um, and it broke a little. I was wondering if it was because some of the variables got <laughs> to be these epically long names like let <laughs> release words delay became falling asleep on the train writing knowing it will arrive and the let release word size is the proper volume of a shout given the confines of this cave. So that's from Agachi. And I wanted to approach some of these same ideas in a project that was a little more pared down. So this is magicforreal.com. Um, it is looking more at the power of words themselves as incantation, especially when there are so many words on the internet, you know, um, executing at 60 times per second, uh, what power is embedded in them. And what would, it, what would a magic word in um, code look like? So being someone that likes to approach heavy subjects with a dose of levity, I, um, when there's so many different ways to approach spells and incantation, kind of was drawn to the more pseudo-Latin nonsense syllables of abracadabra, alakazam, 
Hocus Pocus, Presto Changeo, and a la peanut butter sandwiches from Sesame Street. <laughs> um, so uh, what would this look like in programming languages? I kind of landed on foobar which are um, placeholder variables used in many examples in code and appear a lot in the history of computer science. So they're already out there a lot. Like, what would it mean to um, you know, imbue them with some sort of power? The history of them could have been World War II slang, um, effed up beyond all repair, which is kind of a dark place to start a magic spell, but like, it couldn't get any worse. Um, <laughs> Um, but turns out the history of foo appeared before as a nonsense word in Smokey Stover cartoons in the 30s. And the cartoonist William Holman actually adopted them from uh, the Chinese character foo that he found inscribed on a Jane statue in Chinatown, um, which means good luck or fortune. So, you know, that's, that's a decent start for a magic spell. So here's Fu um, and Bar woven into a loop. This is a for loop. So it's saying as long as this iterator named Fu, it, which starts at zero, is less than Bar, and that's the number of times it repeats, it's going to increase by one. And I wanted to make this sound more like a magic word. So it's um, for let Fu zero, Fu Bar, Fu one. <laughs> Just switch over to Chrome. How might I do this? I guess exit the show. Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, so Magic for real .com. First thing that you do is you want to set your space, right? So let's um, light the candle. And the next thing is you're going to cast the circle, starting with the spirits of the east. I think, let's see, I looked it up on my cell phone compass app <laughs> before doing this. Um, I think east is about this way. So, spirits of the east, join us. Spirits of the south, join us. Okay, spirits of the, the west, I'm facing west. Join us. The north, above, below. Spirits of the center and of the digital the electric inter-hyperspace of connection and virtual manifestation. Join us. Yeah, okay, join us. Welcome. So now we may recite the sacred words and cast your spell. And what should our spell be? Um, may the joy and enthusiasm that we take home from today, <laughs> spread into the world like <laughs> um, ripples <laughs> in an ocean of vanilla pudding. <laughs> Can we all get behind this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, we're ready. So calling on the magic words, let four let foo zero foo bar foo four one. Four let foo zero foo bar foo one. May the joy and enthusiasm that we take home from today spread into the world like ripples in an ocean of vanilla pudding. May the joy and enthusiasm that we take home from today spread into. <laughs> okay, I'm muting it. I won't do it. May the joy and enthusiasm that yeah, we take it, home from. It's not gonna stop. <laughs> 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 You can like close this browser tab and do your other stuff and multitask your magic spells. Um, it's already repeated this 600 and I know almost um, 700 times. So um, yeah, the power of computation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
just should we just leave it up? <laughs> Who's next? Where's um? Oh, perfect. Do I drag it before I do the... Uh, if you drag it first. Okay. Oh, no, you got it. Yeah. yeah. everyone. Sorry for the delay. Um, I just also want to echo a sentiment that a lot of you have expressed, and I'm really grateful to be here. Processing was a big component of my development as an artist and a coder as well. I also just want to say that a lot of the ideas I'm going to talk about here have been discussed already in a lot of ways, especially uh, Ron's discussion of the improbable or um, the this space outside of the expected or possible. Uh, I, but I'm gonna try and fit a somewhat simple but abstract idea into this really tight lightning talk form. So it's gonna be about the limitations of code and how we can make these part of the expressive quality of the medium. So. I'm coming at this with an interest in it as an artist who works with code. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about these ideas not necessarily um, with this in mind, it can be applied to other uses of code, but m I just wanna talk about where I'm coming from. So often what I'm trying to explore when I'm working with code is the futile or the frustrating or the unexpectedly expansive moments that stand in contradiction to those. And software is really good at creating these kinds of experiences through its construction and the way we think about it while we're making it. So this experimentation with this medium has led me to kind of become obsessed with the way limitations operate in terms of emotional effect. So what do I mean when I say limitations? Well, it's a bit blurry, but for our purposes, let's think of it as a barrier between the possible and the impossible within a system. So it can be a generative system, an interactive system, but as I said, I'm talking about art made with code. So this limitation is sort of that outline that defines that shape of the possible. So let's maybe get, so this is maybe a simple visual rendering of it. There's the possible, and then there's all that wavy space out there that is the impossible, right? So this is kind of a, simple way of thinking about this. So when we hear the word impossible, we usually think of things that are, or I usually think of things that are physically impossible, right? I can't fly without the help of machinery um, and things like this, but there are other limitations that aren't based on the physical laws of our world. These are socially constructed limitations, right? Um, so for example, a child that lives in a certain school district in 
uh, LA, for example, can't choose to go to another school um, unless they have the resources necessary to do so. These kinds of socially constructed limitations that are based on often the distributions of resources and power. So um, we're gonna dive into this a little bit deeper, but first let's jump back and spend a little more time thinking about how code relates to this explicitly. So the connection for me exists in the nature of coding. Often when you're c sitting down to make something with code, you're, what you're doing is rendering these boundaries using language. So we have here um, some pseudocode for what is called an if statement or a conditional, which is a, um, a pretty foundational or important uh, part of code. And so here we have if this, then that. So this more or less translates to uh, if this is true, if the current condition of the system is this, then that should happen, right? So in the interest of my argument, we can view this in a different way. So there's that is a subset of the possibility within this. So coding is a type of limitation authoring, if you, right? I like to view it that way. And I think this is something that's maybe embedded in the working process of the medium is thinking of it in this way. So. Uh, to bring this out of the this, that language, let's say that is a yacht within a yacht. So there's this little yacht that goes in the bigger yacht when you're, you feel like being more nimble, I guess. Um, and let's say this is destruction, whether it's environmental destruction or the exploitation of uh, a subjugated class. Uh, there, this makes that possible, right? So to come back to this, the this, or the that that is possible with the this is this kind of destruction. So we, there are many other ways we can map that. The this could be born in a family that is wealthy. Or the that could be voting, and a few generations ago, the this could be white male landowner, right? So these th kinds of structures are rendered explicit when we're coding. So why am I pointing this out? Uh, so code is really a good way of hemming these in and making, rendering them explicit. So I want to think about the parallels between how we view the possibility space of software and the possibility space of society. So a concept that is somewhat ubiquitous in our culture is that of the American dream. We can think of this as a rendering of an infinite possibility space in which anyone who is able, like who has the effort or the willpower to do so can achieve anything, right? So this, uh, this is a narrative in which you are the master of your own fate, and you don't view, limitations aren't necessarily part of the narrative, right? And so we can think of this in terms of that prior configuration, and we wouldn't necessarily see the destruction that is the condition that makes the yacht within a yacht possible. We just see the yacht within a yacht and go, oh, cool, I can get that, right? Um, so I would argue that there is a, a twin mythology that is uh, propagated by technology. Technology is often talked about as this ever-expanding field of possibility, where the empowered user, the software is giving us more and more power. And the danger, I feel, with this sort of narrative is that it uh, negates or defocuses the limitations or the boundaries that are actually the definitive part of what it is to live in a society. So the way that this is talked about often is in, vi is in video game design circles. It's called negative possibility space. So with AAA game production, one direction that, uh, or a primary component of how they think about this sort of design is to defocus the limitations. You don't want to see what's impossible. You want to constantly be surprised by the fact that you can not only kill people as a cool cowboy, you can also fish, right? You don't, you're not thinking about the, all the many, many, nearly infinite things that you can't do. You're thinking about what you can do, right? And so I'm going to lay the stake at the figure versus ground relationship. So this is a term from art theory that basically refers to um, this oscillation between seeing a negative space and a positive space. So this image changes on whether, depending on whether you're seeing the uh, white as the foreground or the black as the foreground, right? So what this pr proposes when we make art that foregrounds possibility and doesn't talk about the limitations or the impossible within its system is it 
it creates a worldview in which we never reflect on the limitations. It encourages a worldview that we don't reflect on limitations or how they define our experience of the world. So just to close up, why do I think this is impo important? Well, I would uh, situate it another word from the title of the talk, which is poetry or poetics. So art can serve to, to facilitate a type of emotional experience, right? And often that isn't in the uh, explicit text of the experience. It isn't in the various components. It's in the structure or how you come to it and how you feel as you move through it. And so this is a, an emotional space that I relate back personally to poetry. And I think poetry, poetic experiences often help to facilitate a metaphorical way of thinking. So if we can begin to think about an infinite possibility space in a tiny bit of a, in a tiny moment of an art experience, then we also think about that in larger aspects of our lives. Everything feels possible. Everything is it, um, defined by the meritocracy or the technocracy that I live in. So I guess what I'm arguing for is art that is constantly forcing us to focus and reflect on feelings of frustration and futility and powerlessness, not because <laughs> everyone needs to feel that all the time, but because uh, <laughs> Um, there's perhaps a more subtle, a more nuanced way of coming to art if we can sense that oscillation between the possible and the impossible, and perhaps it'll encourage us to turn and bite the hand of our master. Um, thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Pollock. I'm from the school. Okay, my name is Peter Pollock. I go to the school in information studies. I'm talking about surveillance and simulating it. So I'm going to use the word algorithms a lot. So I want to talk about what we mean when we talk, what we mean when we, hold on. what we mean when we say algorithms. All right, I got it, thanks. So normally we hear talking about a recipe, a set of rules, some kind of data comes in, it goes into this black box process that we don't know, and then data comes out. And what this kind of language makes us think about is these other conversations about accountability, about opacity, and about bias, which some of you are probably familiar with. So when thinking about these kind of conversations, I think about what kind of traps these conversations put us in. So when we're thinking about bias and we're thinking about transparency in algorithms, what does that make us think about when we're talking about algorithms? And when we're criticizing algorithms, what does that lead our criticisms to think about? So during this presentation, I'm going to be thinking about algorithms more in terms of systems of representation. Uh, so we're actually kind of familiar with that based on the talks that have happened already which is great. I don't really have to go into it too much. If you think about a map representing a river, this is a representation showing different ways that the river can exist and do different things. But what I also want to think about is how algorithms are designed to achieve a goal. So even before we're thinking about bias or transparency, we're already thinking about how the algorithms are designed to achieve a specific purpose before they're even programmed. So if we think about algorithms in this way, then we get these different kind of considerations. Uh, there's certain powers to represent people, represent things. There's these implicit assumptions built into the algorithms. And there's also specific people that are able to do things with algorithms. So thinking about that, uh, I've been working with these public records about algorithmic systems that are developed by the Los Angeles Police Department. And so these documents were uh, retrieved and they're being made accessible by this group in LA called the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, uh, which I work with. So these documents, there's hundreds of them. And they describe basically how these algorithmic systems are supposed to be designed. So they have the design rules for how somebody would implement these systems. So without having access to these systems, I can see specifically what these systems are supposed to do and how they're supposed to be made. So what I do is I look through these documents and thinking about algorithms as systems of representation, I ask these questions. What questions and problems does the algorithmic system propose to solve? What people, places, and things does it propose to represent? And when decisions are made, who makes them? When problems are raised, who accounts for them? So I'm thinking about these considerations. What is built into the algorithm by design? 
not thinking even about uh, how the algorithm is implemented, what algorithms are being used, but specifically in the design principles, what are the considerations there? So starting from these documents that I showed you, I developed these simulations, which they're supposed to represent how these algorithmic systems work. So this is a simulation of this system called Operation Laser. This is Los Angeles Strategic Extraction and Restoration. So this is an LEPD algorithmic system to basically tally all of this crime data that's happening across Los Angeles. So it takes in gun crime data. Remember, this is a simulation, so what I'm showing you isn't actually real. It's important to say that. So we start by taking in gun crime data, and what this algorithm basically does is it sections off certain areas of the city, it's kind of faint, I don't know if you can see it, into these red boxes, which they call laser zones. So we talked actually earlier about redlining, so this is something that we at the Stop LEPD Spying Coalition call digital redlining, right? So you can see how there's these certain areas that are section, sectioned off because they have more gun crime data there. So what happens in these areas is they're not only sectioned off, but additionally what the LEPD, LEPD does is they go into these areas, and if we play along here, just wait for it to happen, what they do is when they enter these areas, they basically take all of the crimes that happen there and they tally up everything that's happened and they basically rank uh, the people that are in there according to the number of crimes that they've committed. But not only this, they also rank them according to the interactions that they've had with the police. So within these regions, they basically tally all the people up that are related to the police or that have just been stopped by the police and they put them on this chronic, chronic offender bulletin. So when I'm making a simulation like this, what I'm thinking about is not how to make the algorithm more fair or more equitable, but I'm thinking about how is this algorithmic system a system of representation that takes these, these regions, takes these people, and represents them in a certain way? Uh, how is the laser zone, for example, a way of sectioning off an area to give justification for ranking people within it? So I'm gonna actually skip ahead if I can. And another thing that I'm thinking about Another thing that I'm thinking about is to what extent these designs of algorithmic systems give the developers and the users of these systems the flexibility to change how they work. So normally we think of flexibility as being a positive thing uh, where we want, we want things to be more flexible, but when you're thinking about systems that have the capacity to represent people, sometimes flexibility is an additional power. So what flexibility does the system give to its developers or users to change the rules of the system and what consequences does this flexibility entail for the subjects of algorithmic systems? So thinking about this, I have another simulation uh, about a different algorithmic system that comes from the LAPD. And this is the record management system. Uh, and this record management system is created by this organization called Palantir, which some of you might be familiar with. And I sometimes make up these like joking, you know, parody logos of these companies that are evil. Uh, so basically what the system does is it tracks all records related to crimes from the LAPD. So basically I have this simulation going for all these crimes that basically the LAP LAPD has written in their documents that they want to track these things. So I basically just simulate them happening and every time they happen I add a new record basically to this pool. So what I'm interested in in terms of flexibility is if there's the flexibility to change these rules for how people are associated then doesn't that make it so that you can basically create any criteria for identifying crimes any criteria for relating people together and then use those in order to change your statistics for how good your crime prediction algorithm is working. So, so here I have two versions of the same simulation. So it's playing through the same story, uh, the same things are happening, people are doing the same things, but on one side you have basically tying, tying people together based on whether they commit similar crimes and on the other side, you have tying people together uh, whether or not they're seen next to each other or whether they're apprehended in the same location. Uh, so these are all things that can be tweaked in this record management system. And what I want you to think about is if these things can be tweaked, then what kind of power does that give to these systems to be able to change the rules so that they can make certain uh, representations of people in reality? So that's kind of a, a, a dark note. Uh, but the question that I want to be thinking about is when algorithms are reformed in response to public pressure, uh, do their design principles change? So when we make appeals for algorithmic bias or transparency, and we're asking for these systems to be more equitable, are we really interrogating the fundamental design principles that are underlying these systems? And also, uh, just to add, 
to be thinking about what kind of design rules would enable us to build alternative algorithmic platforms. And I know this is kind of a generic question, but in making systems like this, I'm thinking about what kind of design rules can be changed in order to make different kinds of platforms that don't do these things. So how deep do we have to go into the algorithms to be able to make something that would do something differently? Okay, thank you. for coming. This has been great. Uh, there's lunch outside, and, uh, and then the next session starts at, at 1.30. Uh, so th thank you to all of our speakers. Yes. Thank you.
is not delusional. But I say this story because to me it's such a perfect example of the way that we think about, um, like of course she would be delusional to the mind of society if Obama was following her on Twitter. She was a young black woman. Why would somebody as important as the president be following somebody like her, right? So the other thing in that story is we see how the hospital and treatment and care is used in a punitive way, meaning you are punished if you need it. So something that I hear a lot from, from friends of mine who are in the disabled community is I don't want to be a burden to my friends, to my family, to society. And I'm like, where did this idea come from that if you're, if you're in need of care, like if you need to eat, if you need to sleep, if you need more rest, if you need to drink more water, if you need to take medication, if you need to recover for three months in a bed, why is this a burden? The reason why we think it's a burden is because we can't produce during that time. Well, of course, this is like a capitalist. You can see how capitalism kind of has an ideology there of people are only worthwhile or have any value if they can produce. And if they can't, then we like to like kind of put them away and lock them up and keep them out of society. Um, so it's my hope that moving you know, forward into the 21st century, the hospital and the prison kind of get further and further away from each other as an institution. I wanted to leave you with one more idea. I wanted to talk about this one, which is something that I hear a lot. I now live in Berlin, and when I come to America, I hear all kind of talk about what we're gonna do about Trump, you know? Like, well, he's unfit to lead, and he's insane. And I'm like, I don't know doesn't seem to me like racism is a mental illness, you know? <laughs> like, I don't think that white supremacy is actually like a disease that requires care. I think it's an ideology. So I just want to kind of point out that one of all of the ones on the board, is that when we're thinking of why certain people shouldn't be doing what they're doing, what is the foundation of that idea that we're basing it all on? And Trump is an example of how we conceptualize illness, especially mental illness, as being evil. How many movies have you ever seen where the villain's behavior is described by being insane, having some kind of mental illness, schizophrenia? What is this new movie by Shyamalan called Glass, where like there's a uh, dissociative identity disorder person in there and he's evil so just sort of like I just put this out for you to think about in our afternoon um, of our sessions we're trying to think through these things together um, but one of the things I think we can start with is how we conceptualize illness at all is it something that's a burden something that means you're evil something that means you're not good enough you don't have value all of that so just start to tease that out maybe in your mind, and if you have questions, of course, you can ask one of us or any of the speakers today. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say for now. All right, thank you. Hello, 
Um, we are going to talk about accessibility in an open source community, but it's not any open source community. We're going to talk about accessibility in the processing community and about a project that we have been working on since 2016-ish um, that is called the P5 Accessibility Project. I'm Luis and this is Claire. Howdy. Okay, so if you were around for the last processing community day, you probably uh, you've likely already heard about the origins of this project, um, which started out as a participatory design project between myself and a woman named Chansey Fleet, who's pictured on the far left of the screen. Um, and Chansey is a blind assistive tech educator and advocate who, for her job every single year, has to plan a banquet. Um, and the only tools that are available to her that are accessible currently are these tools like uh, this wax-coated um, mesh that she can draw on and create these tactile uh, spatial diagrams of uh, floor plans. So we were working together on a touchscreen tonal application uh, that would be accessible, work with her assistive technology, but in order for this project to be fully participatory, when it came time for her to roll up her sleeves and start programming, we found that most of the free um, learning resources and just sort of general resources around programming online were not accessible to her screen reader. Um, and screen readers, for you uh, that you don't that don't know, um, are a sort of non-visual interface between a computer and a person. Generally, people that are blind or have low vision and they translate the computer's interface either to Braille. Um, on the far left of the screen is a refreshable Braille display, or they also do speech synthesis, so they speak aloud the interface um, to, to users. So the resources online didn't pair well with this assistive technology and didn't translate the, the information on the screen uh, very well. And that was true of learning resources that incorporated code snippets. Often those were pictures of code. Um, uh, development environments and text editors that have special features like syntax highlighting didn't translate those, uh, that, that information that's really important for code learners um, uh, using screen readers. Okay. So we approached the Processing Foundation who of course has this sort of mission to promote software literacy and make code learning accessible. Um, and that, you know, their mission worked really well with our sort of goal which was to make uh, processing more accessible to people that are blind or have low vision. All right, so in order to do this work, uh, Chansey, uh, you know, was very new at programming and we knew we needed to go to experts. So we formed an advisory committee uh, with Josh Miele, Sina Baram, and Austin Serafin, all blind programmers that gave us great insights into the work that's kind of come before us, uh, where some projects had pitfalls and where we can improve upon them. Um, we had to develop a bunch of uh, tactile learning tools, a curriculum, and software that made code learning more accessible. And to do that, we worked with fabulous educators and programmers to develop uh, the tools that would support learning throughout a series of uh, workshops that we've taught. So now we've done about eight. And we do like a mix of P5 and uh, general web development. We've done uh, workshops and two uh, full courses in web development, uh, one at the New York Public Library, and then another one brought us all the way to Gulu, Uganda to work with a, a tech camp that's out there uh, with uh, youth and young adults. Okay? Okay, um, so when, when we started working on making P5 a little bit more accessible, Cassie was also started, starting to work on the editor. So we joined Cassie and we started thinking of how can we make the P5 editor have an accessible output that shows the canvas or displays the canvas in an accessible way. Um, first we started thinking about screen readers and how they match with browsers and actually that's something that changes every week almost. Um, <laughs> sometimes the screen readers work well and then the next day they don't. But usually we recommend using JAWS, which is a, a paid, paid screen reader, and Chrome and NVDA and Firefox. If you ever want to try using the editor with the screen reader, go ahead. Um, so for the editor, we did several things. The first thing we did was work on 
work on accessible outputs. We all know the canvas, or those of us that have coded with P5 or processing, know that the canvas is actually an array of pixels and that we cannot actually see or, or know what the shapes on the canvas are unless we are seeing it. So one of the things that we had to do was to piggyback on the code of any P5 sketch and get the arguments and the shapes from whatever users were writing and then using that to create descriptions. We created a plain text description that reads out loud what the elements on the canvas are. We also created a tonal system that uses panning to indicate left to right movement or right to left movement and it changes pitch to indicate uh, top to bottom movements. And also a table of descriptions. Tables are super useful when you're using a screen reader because they allow you to know where a shape or an element is positioned spatially. So it's essentially a grid where you can navigate it with your, with your keyboard and listen to what is in that space of the grid. We also implemented this high contrast uh, theme for the editor, which is super helpful for people that uh, have low vision and for programmers in general that prefer a high contrast editor. Um, and we work with Lauren on implementing web accessibility guidelines on the P5.js website. And we still have a lot of work to do. It's a work in progress. But w one of the funny stories about this whole uh, process was actually color names. Some of the HTML color names are tan. And w when I tan, I tan in a different way than Claire. Um, another color name is cornflower blue. And another one is floral white. Um, I didn't know what floral white is. And, and when, when screen readers read an HTML color name, it's very hard for the user to understand what that color name means. Um, one of the web accessibility guidelines is that content shouldn't be readable, it should be understandable. So we actually developed an NPM module uh, based of Crayola colors and testing with different people and came up with a list of colors that are more user friendly. And actually Claire had really great results when testing that. It's a really great resource to use in the web development classes as well as the work that we've done with P5. It's very helpful. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, the, the color namer was a really fabulous tool when we were teaching our workshops in uh, P5 and web development. It's really helpful. Okay. But then we realized that this interceptor that we created for the editor was not enough. There are P5 sketches out everywhere and especially in the P5.js uh, website. And those didn't have the accessible outputs. So we moved from an interceptor into a library that can be plugged into any HTML file with a P5 sketch and produce the three outputs that we have as of now. We also started working on learning resources um, that guide users on how to use P5 with a screen reader and created lesson plans that can be implemented um, for users that use screen readers. A funny thing about, um, about the whole project is that we started thinking first about making everything in the canvas accessible, but then the focus kind of changed into making basic shapes and basic structures accessible. That's perhaps because as Dan says, P5 is great for making stuff, but it's fantastic for learning. Um, so we focus more on the basic shapes that can allow people to learn uh, the essential things about programming and coding. Okay. Cool. So what's next? Oh, there is a lot of work to, to, to do. Um, making learning resources more accessible is definitely something that we have to do. Um, we realized last year that it's not only about making the canvas accessible, it's about the way that we write tutorials, it's about the way that we write uh, lessons and about the way that we write the documentation of P5. For example, just two little things. When we have a code example, it's usually better to say what the context 
is before putting a code snippet so that a screen reader user can know what they're about to hear before they actually hear it. And even when we use comments within code, it's better to put the comments before the actual lines of code in a different line so that, again, there's kind of a, a, a sign that tells people what they're about to hear. Um, there is a lot of work in developing new learning materials um, that are actually focused for users that use screen readers. We definitely need to improve our descriptions because when, when we have, for example, a smiley face on a canvas, the screen reader will read it as three or four ellipses, but it will not tell us what the relationship between those ellipses are and the shape that it makes. Um, and we need to improve the IDE. Right now, we are using Code Mirror in the editor, and Code Mirror is not very accessible, but in 2019, Code Mirror will move towards accessibility, so that's a great thing that is happening. And we need to engage you. We need to engage teachers, software developers, and designers so that we can make the P5 community more interested in accessibility and more accessible to more people. We, when we were planning this talk, I was actually telling Claire that perhaps we didn't need an accessibility library. Perhaps the P5 library itself should include accessible outputs. Um, but that's kind of a, a radical <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> and, and we also need you, the ones that are creating lessons, the ones that are creating um, tutorials, to consider accessibility when you do that. It's way better when we think about accessibility from the beginning than when we go and adapt something that already exists. So join us. Um, <laughs> over the past year, people that we didn't know, because almost everyone that has worked on this project knows someone that knows us, um, but people that we didn't know just popped up on GitHub and decided to work with us. Um, it's been a great learning experience for everyone, and just join us and talk to us and come to the session later today. Cool. Thank you. Hello. One moment, sorry. I love this community. I love it. Um, it's it's so it's so nice to be here. It's such a um, an honor to contribute to this community in even a very small way. Um, so my name is Luke Fishbeck, and the next slide has a video. If I can figure out how to oh wrong computer. Um, the audio may be a little extreme at first, and then we'll turn it down. So I wanted the, the content of this talk to somehow move past the idea that accessibility always has to be in response to, to a system that is just out of control, uh, that sometimes uh, accessibility can be uh, a positive, um, you know, an invention of it in its own right, um, that just is imagining something that is new. So uh, I, I make work that doesn't assume a common language and fits poorly inside of frames, uh, work that only makes sense over a very long or a very short time, and uh, only from multiple perspectives. Um, work that doesn't necessarily privilege a single point of view, 
Um, and this usually makes uh, awkward collaborations. Um, the, the video is from uh, performance, and uh, I come from a background in music. Uh, I keep returning to music for its metaphors uh, about how to communicate uh, complexity and embodied knowledge, how to compress a lot of information about affect, bodies, time, attention, culture, sensation into a single event and to share the experience of that event with other people. I love a poor image. Um, as Hito Starlow put it, a poor image is lossy, lightweight, and all around. It depicts conditions, not things, um, reality, not real things. Um, I like images that are out of gamut, distorted, damaged, and clipping, hinting at the intensity or the specificity of an experience that can't be duplicated. I'm going to have to f come up with a better solution for switching slides. <laughs> oh my god. I'll move. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'll work with it. You guys cool? Okay. So I'd like to pose an open question about the difference between representing, uh, containing and compressing something, and recognizing something, uh, indicating it or showing it, um, seeing yourself in something or just feeling it. Um, as Vishali Manavanan says, I am tired of composing in ways that look well. It seems strange to be presenting to you guys as an expert on pain. Uh, I, I think it's obvious that I present as able, but maybe not. <laughs> I don't know, maybe not. Um, so, uh, I, yeah. I started making these images when I was diagnosed with lymphoma and started going through chemotherapy and started just experiencing a, a beautiful range of new feelings about uh, both um, my body, the way that I saw myself, and the way that other people saw me, and the way that I saw other people. So all these kinds of intersubjective ways of being. Um, so these images are, are a facial recognition software that you know, takes a, a model for how you might recognize a face or distinguish one face from another and uh, flips it around to become generative. So it starts generating uh, new faces that uh, don't, re don't really face inwards or outwards, I think, is the, is the sim simplest way to say it, probably. Um, Bam. Okay. Uh, so this this idea of like an invertible model, I think, is something I'm going to be working with. Um, and I, I don't have a, a goal with it yet. I, I'm sort of mistrustful of goals at first, so this is sort of background first first look. Um, this this image and, and many of the other ones that follow are from a data set of images made by pain patients. That it's a it's it's held by the National Health Services in the UK. Uh, it's all anonymized because it's technically medical data. Um, I'm sharing it with you because I think it's an example of the, the variety of this, this beautiful variety and the ways that people can articulate their own experience. Um, and putting it into images is something that I think is really crucial, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, another open question. Uh, should we make a computer that feels pain? Um, this is sort of in response to philosopher Daniel Dennett's 1978 essay, Why You Can't Make a Computer That Feels Pain. Um, why you can't make a computer that feels pain. I thought it was strange that he accused me. Uh, <laughs> it, 
according to Dennett, it's not because of any limitation of technology, uh, but because of our definition of pain, uh, which is unfixed, slippery, and incomplete. Pain escapes measurement and specificity. Uh, where does pain happen? Uh, the source of injury, but sometimes there's not a s one source. Uh, in the brain or in the body, in society. Uh, pain can't be interrogated. It must be acknowledged, believed, granted as real. This is a fundamental ethical aspect of pain that for Dennett shows why simulated pain doesn't make sense. But the inability to acknowledge the pain of others is the central problem here. So could a simulation help? Um, these are just some pictures I picked out as being similar from the archive, yeah. Um, it may make more sense to ask software what pain is and then to use that understanding generatively. So not a simulation of pain necessarily, but a shadow, an imprint, a surround of pain. Even if pain can be simulated, why would we want to do this? Mia Mingus says, the best analysis in the world is useless if we don't treat each other well. So is a simulation more like care or analysis? Computers are better at doing, not describing, maybe. The language used to describe and interpret experience and sensation, especially for caregivers and medical professionals, to describe and interpret the experience and sensations of other people tends to reinforce norms and power imbalances to limit agency and understanding for everyone involved. A simulation could help understand the patterns of how socially acceptable normatives become established, how boundaries become established, how we communicate, name, and label pain, how we conceptualize, see our own pain and the pain of others. An active simulation could happen slowly with continual input guidance from multiple sides, like listening and speaking at the same time. Adding image and other external forms to the conversation about pain adds nuance, helps to view intensity objectively as part of ourselves, but also separate. Images tolerate and sustain ambiguity, allowing complex things to remain complex. A simulation could show how information is created, carried, and distributed about pain. Pain being a complex multimodal experience, even approaching the problem of simulation may result in complex multimodal learning. Why should we be very careful doing this? To consider what pain means to solve the problem of pain without negating it, there are good and bad flavors of pain. Importantly, to not treat people in pain as lessons to be learned or hidden messages to be unpacked, but rather as agential actu actors with desires, goals of their own. Problems with quantifying pain, such as surveys and scales, are that it poorly represents the ex experience of chronic pain, minimizes idiosyncrasy, variety, and nuance, it undermines self-determined nature of pain, undermines the privacy of pain sufferers. Should this process of designing a simulation be placed in the middle of a care network as a relational process, or should it be very private? Also, watch the profit. Affective computing, sentiment analysis, com computational empathy, including self-empathy, is pretty deeply embedded in commerce, and it's only getting more intense. Uh, this is to answer Johanna's question about uh, being a burden and having an occupation. Uh, there's this question of participating in capitalism uh, just by feeling as effective labor. Why is pain special? It's special because everyone knows it's special. But where is it located? What is it made out of? And how do we express it? Pain is complex, a whole greater than its parts. 
where change, resistance to change, don't necessarily imply any outside force. Relationships between wholes and parts may change unexpectedly. For instance, emotion and pain can act as separate layers or together. Pain is versatile. It adapts and persists. Contingent and idiosyncratic, pain resists being reduced to rules. It can't or shouldn't be proved or disproved. It varies with attention and distraction, and it depends on all kinds of context. Any model of pain must be biological, psychological, and social in equal parts. As a social experience, as an intensity, some aspects of pain can be measured and others can't. Pain can have substance, it can be intensely specific, and it can radiate wildly. Pain is liminal, imperfect, and ambiguous. It is embodied, and it is alien. Ownership of pain is complicated. Is empathic pain the same as first-hand pain? Pain is a material and an event, and a form that emerges over time. It is an interval between all other kinds of experience and materials and forms. It erases, obliterates, holds apart, and delineates other kinds of experience, materials, and forms. Elaine Scarry wrote that pain actively destroys language. To hear pain, you know it to be irrefutably authentic. But how can pain actively destroy? Does it have its own agency, intention to make us do things? Pain provides a gradient of motivation, a behavioral drive. Lastly, pain can easily become anonymous. But when given interdependence, it takes on beautiful shapes. I'm just going to quickly show you these projects that are not mine, but they're basically doing what, when I started thinking about this, I wanted to do, so I felt like I should share them with you. Uh, Deborah Padfield is a artist and researcher in the UK uh, who made these cards that let people uh, discuss their pain in a way that is outside of themselves, you know, to use them as cards. And it, everything, so the an anonymity, anonymity of pain is something I find um, very compelling too. Uh, this is a, a video that has been an anonymized. So what happens when we give an external form to pain, whether it's visual, performative, atmospheric, physical, temporal, virtual, linguistic, etc.? For people in pain, the experiencing body and its metaphors can be difficult to separate. Images, ritual simulations, carry knowledge and build community around objects in common. For patients and caregivers, acting cooperatively with these objects can help to open dialogue and reduce hierarchies, uh, as in Deborah Petfield's work. This is another project of hers, was to do collaborative portraits of people who had specifically face pain. Uh, where each party, a caregiver and a patient, would take turns drawing a line of the face until they had a complete face or multiple faces. These external forms, everything from art therapy to immersive environments to ritual performances, include both description, precision, finding the right word, and metaphor, projecting into the world. Metaphor speaks about what we don't know in terms of what we do know, extending the boundaries of a shared world. It gives both private and shared experience clarity and coherence, bridging between inner and outer, private, private and public, facing directly towards linguistic conceptual absences, gaps and lacks. Who or what are these forms for? Recognition or communication? Viewed from outside, self-duplication in a landscape in a body to express contrasting states simultaneously, doubling, externalizing, materializing, is representation always about displacement or can it stay rooted in context in the moment? Looking out while looking in, both inward and outward facing, is pain a frame, a filter, a mask, a lens? Yeah. Thank you.
All right. So we have the final speaker. We're running slightly behind, but I promise you that you're going to get your coffee break and restroom break. Don't leave. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel. Um, I was initially pretty nervous about admitting this, but after this morning's State of the Union, <laughs> um, I don't feel so scared to say that I've actually never used processing to code anything before. <laughs> um, I work mostly in HTML and CSS and jQuery, so um, I'm very grateful to Taeyun and Sin for giving an open call and giving me an opportunity to come and speak. Um, and so. When you're writing these things, there's always that element of write what you know, write what you know. And since I obviously don't know much about processing, um, what I can talk about is care. And um, I'm so pleased to know that I've resonated with so many of the themes here of care as a gift, of um, just being um, open to others' experiences and delving deeply in with someone. So instead of lining up like this is how you care for someone and revisiting those foundations in such a linear way i wanted to share a story um, so when i was very young <laughs> um, i had i'm a, i'm the youngest of four siblings and all of my siblings are at least 10 years older than me so there's a big gap in our experience but we were all from a very young age um, physically and emotionally abused by our parents and I'm going to start reading now because I don't want to let this get too detailed and weird. <laughs> um, but uh, my closest sibling is 10 years older than me. And when my dad divorced and remarried, um, from divorced my mom and remarried to my stepmother, he took custody of my older siblings first. And I was less than a year old when they all left the house and I was left behind with my abusive mother. And it wasn't until I was three years old that my dad came and rescued me from that situation. But by then, two years alone with, with an abuser, <laughs> you're very damaged. And I was less than four years old. And I didn't know how to process or how to um, really go through the feelings that I was having and, and what I was experiencing in a new family, a new language. Um, having a new mother and I when I think back to that time all I remember really is crying a lot <laughs> um, and not knowing how to voice what I was feeling and as crazy as that time was I remember starting to receive these letters from my siblings and um, they were filled with careful curiosity about what I was going through um, and filled with worry about my mental health, things that they saw me going through that they had also experienced and advice for how to get through these things. And maybe I couldn't fully comprehend it when I was reading it or receiving it, um, but every Christmas or on my birthday, I looked forward to a card that I could open and know that my siblings were looking out for me. And it wasn't always on a holiday. Sometimes it was a surprise. Uh, another story that sticks out in my mind is in my first grade class, I was opening my lunch pail and inside, kind of stuffed on the front, I found my favorite caramel apple lollipop and a little note from my sister that said, I wanted you to have something that made you smile today and I love you. And I happened to look out the window and I saw her walking down the ramp of my school and exiting the gate and realizing she walked to school, to my school, to give me something and how much that meant to me. Um, and I guess when we're thinking about this idea of coding as a form of care, that is what I hope that it can be, is stemming from a place of deep connection and understanding and whether you are of that community that you're trying to reach to or you see someone that you would like to connect to, 
let that, whatever you make, whatever your gift is, let it come from a place that is where you've been standing beside them and knowing them before even creating anything, walk with them. And I also feel like that's such a basic concept and I've been nervous about just saying this, like talk to people, get to know them, but standing at the opening of what this field can be or this art form can be, um, I wanted to revisit these foundations just so that we can remember that gift that we hopefully have received that touched us at a time that we really needed it or relating to that struggle of trying to think of a gift for someone that you don't know very well and how awkward that can feel giving a gift and having that anxiety of will they like this or not but um, just remembering how you should take the time and these walls that get built between us of fear of will I offend them uh, fear of will I be able to relate to them well enough those are valid fears and I feel those a lot myself but that shouldn't stop you from trying to reach out because if they can feel how genuine you are and how non-judgmental or that your approach is genuine then there is always that leeway built in for this person is really trying and there's that test I, that you kind of pass <laughs> when you meet someone or like is this person worthy enough for me to allow inside of my sanctuary <laughs> to um, let them get to know who I am so just try to keep that at the forefront and that's something that I'm learning as well is just to be vulnerable and to be able to share your experiences and be curious um, as hard that, as that can be that your curiosity is still very 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 important and needed and welcomed um, even if you're within a marginalized community there are questions that are offensive but I think like I said, we always leave that room for someone who is genuinely searching. So, um, and I guess. So, and I, when I started writing this talk, I was also thinking of what can these projects actually look like? What does a coding for care project look like? And I am a recent graduate of the School for Poetic Computation, and so I've been following the projects of the students that have matriculated after me. And there was a project by a student named Marcus Fleming uh, called Help Desk. And I spoke with him about his project and what it is is just a simple blue screen that has the question, what's your issue? And you type in what you're feeling for that day, what your emotional state is for that day, and it prints a small ticket that you hang with the tickets of people that have come before you. And he spoke about how it was so powerful for him to see the reactions of people that saw a similar issue to their own or saw something that they didn't realize was an issue or just that solidarity that's felt from seeing someone's vulnerability and relating to it or taking it in as a new thing. And when I asked him what inspired him, he said it was because he, his father was a tech support worker who was always giving support to people over the phone but never receiving support in return and how that changed him into someone that was a little bit more angry um, and descending into a little bit of sadness because he didn't have that outlet in return. So his son saw his father's pain and created an outlet that he thinks his father would have wanted. And I think that's so powerful and so simple and that coding as care doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It can just be something simple like recognizing that pain isn't being represented in a way that is like comprehensible um, and trying to find ways that are more um, easy to consume or understand. And so I want to just encourage everyone to think about what experiences you've been having, what you wish you could see, um, pain that you've seen other people experience and how you can respond to that 
or create something that speaks to them. And um, okay. for me, I'm just hoping to have more conversations and connect with more people um, that I don't normally connect with. So please come speak to me, I would love to. And um, I hope that you will too. And I hope you create some beautiful gifts. So thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you Rachel. And Luke and Claire and Luis. So we have a workshop by Beth, Best Friends Learning Gang that's called Alien Bodies. And Claire and Luis is gonna do another workshop on accessibility in P5. And, and Casey Reese has asked me to re remind you that there's actually an exhibition happening outside for the undergraduates from the uh, Design Media Arts Department from UCLA. So you should go out, take a break, take a right. And uh, the School for Poetic Computation has a conference here tomorrow called Learning to Teach. It starts at 10 a.m. and it's a much smaller conference about pedagogy and curriculum. Ask me about it, we'll make some announcements at the end of the program again, but let's talk about this. Thank you so much, Processing Foundation and the community.
Can you just minimize those other ones while mine is up? And full screen the browser. No, just go to the green, the green button. Whenever you're ready. That's when they'll turn it on. I'm ready right now. I'm I, waiting I for it. So yeah, okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Are we all good? Hi, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Radical Pedagogy Lightning Talks. My name is A.M. Dark. I'm an artist, I'm a game designer, I'm an educator. Um, for those of you who missed the opening remarks, I am a new professor at UC Santa Cruz within Art and Design, Games and Playable Media. I am also the first Lightning Talk speaker. So, like I said, I became a speaker three days ago, and I thought, sure, sure I can do this. I mean, on New Year's Eve, I went into anaphylaxis, and I ended up at the ER. And that's not so important because I was at the ER. I'm clearly alive, that's fine. But the quarter started seven days after that. And instead of getting to prepare for the quarter for those seven days, I was mostly asleep on Benadryl. So I showed up to my first class, and I said, you know what? We're going to wing it and see how it goes. So I have a lot of practice in radical pedagogy, and you're going to get that performance today. So the title of, this, of my talk is, uh, You're Doing a Great Job, Professor. And yes, that is a quote from one of my students. It was written in the margins of their homework, and it touched my heart, because like, I need that encouragement. <laughs> and that was an example of some of the success I've had in engaging in experimental teaching practices. Also, somebody has to keep time for me, because I love to go on tangents. Dorothy, please keep my time. So the talk, I said, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I've been teaching. I've only been teaching for like a year and change. And I said, I'm going to give a talk about like all these experimental teaching things I've done. And I'm going to have it like, you know, tell you all the things I've done. And then I realized that like nine minutes is not two hours. So instead of that, I'm going to tell you about all of the teaching I've done uh, in this year. Because quite a lot of uh, radical stuff has happened just in the, in the last two weeks. I also want to let you know that I have been uh, trying to intermittently live tweet the conference. And in preparation for the conference, I started um, this Twitter thread, which I encourage everybody to follow if they want to know more. Um, I started this thread, and I will keep updating this thread with resources on my teaching. The first thing that I did is share my syllabus, and I'll be sharing other documents. So um, I will definitely share out my Twitter handle, and then you'll be able to follow that, follow along with my experiments um, throughout the year. So I want to follow up with um, experiment number one, which is, ooh, is that going to load? It is going to load. So again, this is public. Uh, you can find it. So I started off the quarter thinking, I do not like how syllabi are legalistic, and I have to make them 10 pages long because there's all this addenda that the university wants in there. And some of the stuff is important. You know, like Title IX is important. Uh, you know, disability resources are important. But the way that they're framed in syllabi make it seem like the only way I would support a student is because I have to by law. And it feels kind of like intimidating and just like impersonal. So I thought, I told myself, I said, Aaliyah, just be normal, just be normal. Stop doing weird stuff, be normal. But like I said, I was in the hospital. So then all my plans to like be a normal professor went out the window. And then I was like, well, I could fall back on that radical thing of like not having a real syllabus. And so that's what I did. <laughs> So the syllabus is not a contract. This syllabus, you can't even see it, but it's one page long, and it only has four points. And I'm going to try to focus this talk on just the first point, because I think that's what I have time for. But again, please come find me. I'm happy to talk about this stuff, and, and you can follow me throughout the year. So the first point is, I'm going to say it by heart. The idea that students and instructors are not adversaries, right? Like the construction of a syllabus is usually, oh God, I have to consider every possible loophole students are gonna to try to find and exploit so I can cover it. Oh, if your grandma's best friend's mom got sick, you need a doctor's note to miss, right? Like if you uh, were really sick, but maybe kind of sick, but like you were well enough to watch Netflix but not well enough to come to class, like I don't know if I can excuse that. Like there are all of these, you know, situations in which I have to account for and like, First of all, I don't like it to do that. It's boring. Like, that is not why I became a professor. Like, I want to engage with students. 
The other thing is like, I'm dealing with adults and I find it really strange the ways in which I have to sort of treat them like um, either children or like my adversaries. So I just scrapped that. And I didn't know what was gonna come of that, but I'm gonna tell you some of the ways in which that manifested. So first thing, if we are collaborators and co-conspirators, and I take that approach, and I no longer think of the students trying to like outwit me, and I'm not trying to outwit them, then I can do things like not have an attendance policy. And I have a lecture of 200 students. They are not required to show up to my lecture. I want them to show up because they want to show up, because they're passionate, and they're interested in the content. So immediately when I announce that, a student comes up to me and says, hey, so uh, I can't really make it to any of the lectures. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Celia, this was a dumb idea. Do you see? Do you see why you need to be normal? Because this is the, this is the thing. And in my mind, my normal professor status, because I'm trying to, like, like I said, perform expertise, and I'm thinking, what would a professor say who is like important and had authority? And I was like, well, no, no, you have to deal with this as a co-conspirator. So instead of worrying about, you know, how dare they disrespect me, have the audacity to sign up for a class that they're never going to go to, so what would I do if we're on the same team? Well, one, this student didn't have to come up to me because they know they're not losing any points. They came up to me to ask, hey, I can't make it to these lectures, can you record them? So they wanted to still have the experience and it wasn't about the grade. And when I thought about it that way, I said, you know, I don't know anything about recording lectures, but I'll look into it and I'll find out. Turned out I maybe knew a little th bit about recording lectures, um, but I always found it very intimidating because I'm not always the most organized person. Hello, <laughs> writing my talk as I speak it. Um, but I am, if I may say so myself, a little bit funny and a little bit charming. And when I'm off my rhythm, those things can carry me in person. In a recording, when I fumble or stutter or misspeak or, or, or get a little flustered, I'm like, oh God, the idea that that will be recorded to be played over and over and over out of context, possibly without any of the like charm coming through, is incredibly intimidating. And so I didn't want to do it. And part of me not wanting to do that is this idea that um, once again, when I assume that students are adversaries and I assume that they are looking to judge me, that they are sitting there thinking, who's this lady? What's up with all her eyeliner? What's up with her big hair? She's teaching in games and tech, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm projecting my assumptions about who they are and what they think about me. I assume that they're looking for me to fail and then I respond in ways that aren't productive to any of us. But now here I have this student and I say, okay, you know what? Instead of fighting you on this, you can't ever come to lecture. Bold flex, but okay. <laughs> you know what I did? I just went and found out how to record my lectures. And it was super easy, and it took all of five minutes, and it's so much better for everyone. It's better for me because I realized, like, one, I got past that sort of hurdle of being afraid. Um, I can now look back on my own lectures and see what I missed. I teach the same classes. I can make this better. My life is easier. It also, in accommodating that one student who I would have previously um, discre you know, sort of brushed off. I now have a class where students with disabilities who don't have physical access can uh, be part of the class. Students who are sick or have work or for whatever reason can be part of the class. I have students who are working from home and do group exercises that we do in lecture with their roommates. And it's really inspiring to see like their, it didn't, uh, students didn't become less engaged, they became more engaged just because of this one choice. Am I like already out of time? I have one minute. Okay, 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 I wanna say one more thing, because that's all I can say. The first thing that I did when I did the syllabus is I, the first assignment has been these weekly journals. And in the first weekly journal, I said, read this one page syllabus, and then I added some stuff like proposed assignments, all of it was flexible, and give me feedback. Side note, I wanted this so that we could collaborate on building this course, which we did, but the benefit was that every single one of my students read the syllabus. <laughs> Turns out, when we operate as collaborators, we get some of the things that we want anyway. I was also worried that no one would show up to the class. I'm at the end of the second week of teaching. My class is always packed. My class has people standing at the back waiting for a seat. 
they don't have to show up, they don't have to be there. There's so much more that I wanna say, so I'm gonna tweet it. <laughs> There's all this stuff about radical inclusive feminism where like some students walked out of my class, one person called me aggressive. Oh yeah, I did a lecture on inclusive, uh, on intersectional feminism, and that's all the lecture was about. It was not about games or history. Uh, and students were like, whoa. Uh, but after that, I had a line of students stay late to shake my hand, to give me hugs. Okay, I'm gonna go just slightly over the minute. I was gonna tell you some of the things that they said, which are on Twitter, and I'm very proud of. Be fast. Oh no, okay, bad, bad. I'm gonna use my phone. My phone is great. <laughs> this is what I mean about radical pedagogy being like vulnerable and inhuman. You don't have to be perfect to have like a cushy job at UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> you just have to be yourself and you just have to be authentic. Okay. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Okay, so I gave this, oh, did you find it? You know, just reflect on, on all the really cool things I said earlier. Just think about it. Get the, yeah, fix that slide that we have to add. Let's do this. Okay. Man, I tweeted a lot since I got here. And then I retweeted Snoop Dogg. <laughs> okay. Oh, I made a joke about how streaming Overwatch should be called oversharing. That was cool. Okay, I found it, I found it. <laughs> all right. I'm just gonna read the tweet because I also make this public, my students follow me and stuff. Your girl just gave a whole ass lecture on Sandy Locks, that's Kimberly Crenshaw, in my History of Digital Games class. Folks walked out, one called me aggressive, a line of students stayed late to tell me, thank you, great job, keep doing it. One student said that she'd heard of me and was excited to take my class and that I had exceeded her wildest expectations. I have chills just saying this, they're amazing. I had a student who come up to me and said, you know, I was uncomfortable like you said I would be, but that's good. You make this class exciting and I wanna be here. And then I had one white guy who came up to me and said, I am the privileged white guy and I wanna know how to do better, but I don't know how to do better because I don't know who to ask, and I don't know who to talk to and I said, you know, a secret of social justice is that we tell you like, we're not here to educate you, and that's true. But also, what we don't say is it's really hard to learn when you can't ask anyone. So I've opened a space in my class where people can ask any question they want in good faith, that's our operating system, good faith, and I will answer it. Why? Because I'm literally paid to educate them, and they show up to learn. <laughs> and that's my talk. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm super geeked out to be here as somebody who's been teaching herself processing since like 2007 out of like the orange book um, and seeing actual humans <laughs> that I've been following online for a long time. I just have to say I'm really, really, um, I feel like it's a huge privilege to be here and I'm really, really happy. Um, so please come say hi to me. I don't know like anybody. Come say hi to me later. Um, my talk is called A Cohort, Not a Curriculum. I think you'll find that um, it may be more accurately termed a cohort and a curriculum. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the sort of lab and cohort of students I manage in Ogden, Utah. Um, so this is, this is Utah. You've probably seen skiing in Utah and mountains. This place that looks like the surface of Mars is right outside of Robert Smithson's spiral jetty. Uh, these are my parents. And this is actually what it looks like. There are no camera tricks here. So I encourage you to come visit um, for wild spaces like this school, which means um, we 
population uh, of Ogden. 100 majors, we graduate about 30 BFAs a semester or a year. And this is my lab, um, and that's the actual view. I, I started this out of a small, small, small capital improvement grant that I had a week to write, um, which means I got a bunch of equipment and I had a lot of money, but I had no, no program, no staffing, no curriculum to support it. Uh, but uh, those of you who are in academics and probably other disciplines know you have to take the money when you get it, uh, so we did. Um, what's great about this space and what I'm here to talk to you about is the fact that because this is my side hustle, uh, I also direct the core curriculum. Because this is my side hustle, because I had no plan, I have to let my students run this space. I have to let them take the lead on, on what happens here. So I probably wouldn't, I'm not sure what I would have got, I guessed, but I don't think this is the list of things I thought would happen in my lab when I first grabbed the money. Um, so my students are now doing mixed reality projects, interactive projections, vinyl cut installations, plotter drawings, web-based art, materialist histories, bookmaking, and even mixed media painting. Um, I don't think I would have done a very good job guessing, and I'm, I'm happy that this is what's happening and not what I guessed, and certainly not what my, uh, my administrators would have wanted. Right, so, so, so it's working out. Um, and there are about four things that make this successful um, in my mind so far. So we've only been open a year and a half, not even two years. Uh, so it's a really kind of infant project. Um, but a few things. One is that our core curriculum introduces technology in a really friendly way. So you don't have to elect to be a media student or a tech student. Um, you go into a, a course called Surface Shape and Form, and the first thing you do is draw pictures in processing. Um, and we just smile and get through that. A lot of them don't know they're going to be in a computer lab, much less doing coding. Um, but so far, it works. Uh, we just pretend like that's what you do in an intro art class, and they roll with it. Um, in their basic design concepts class, they model in VR and 3D print those objects. And so it's, it's happening in the thousand level courses before you can decide whether you do tech or not. So we just kind of hit them with it early on. This is, this is one of my um, uh, core, found, core curriculum students, and we, so we do a project like this, right? So this is a plotter drawing generated and processing done on top of an inkjet print, so we kind of take them through their paces, um, and they do this in the fourth week of the curriculum. And a student like this is one that I might bring into my cohort as we move forward. Um, the other thing, I mentioned I have no staffing. I have a group of students who want access to our facility. Um, they're my lab rats. I'm real cheesy and they're okay with that. Um, they kind of roll with it. I get to be kind of geeky so they don't have to. Um, the magic, the important thing about my assistants is they get access to the lab for one hour of monitoring a week. Uh, and I'll, I'll remind you later that I have to enforce that. If I see them putting in two, three, four hours, I gotta pull them back and make sure they're taking care of themselves before they take care of my lab. So there they are, they're, they're so very sweet. And, and as you, you might imagine, they kind of take up residence in that space pretty quickly. And, and they get real protective of it. <laughs> so some of the things they're kind of working on and tinkering with in their spare time. Okay, the, the third is the, what my students call Cyborg Book Club. This started as an informal reading group. Um, I got them started with a reading list, but they do most of the heavy lifting now in finding readings um, and um, developing projects. So most students started out because it was fun, because they needed vocabulary to talk about the things they were thinking about. Um, but should they want to earn independent study credit, they write papers, they do projects, um, and and the, the advantage to this is that I read things I wouldn't have read. I read things I've always been meaning to read. Um, but, it, but with or without credit, I had students at their peak reading 100 to 200 pages a week over the summer for fun um, in this track. So, so there, I think there was something about that engagement and vulnerability that made that work. Okay, I'm gonna fly through. Um, students in that book group are people like Monica Bone. This is also from my intro class. That's a processing drawing. She made a beautiful book out of that. That's a plotter drawing from her book. Ooh, 
Um, and uh, Lou Lily Schaefer, really interested in interiority and exteriority. Um, so even though we're sitting in the lab and we're talking a lot about technology, my students aren't necessarily screen people um, through and through. Um, so Lou Lily does a lot of painting, and we learned very early that she's a lousy writer. She's brilliant, she's great in discussion, but if you ask her to write a formal paper, it fails miserably. So, um, so in place of that, we, she's writing the sort of poetic, hyperlinked, heavily footnoted response that looks an awful lot like her paintings. And finally, I have independent study students. Um, I usually take a small group, and they've got to have complementary skills. I don't have time to really teach anything to this cohort, so they really have to teach each other. I'm there to make space. They do most of the heavy lifting. Um, the, we track progress in Google Docs, um, and, and one of the things that's worked well for me is that the students might be doing a project in sculpture or painting, and they can earn credit with me for documenting their workflows in the lab. So they're building a library of procedures and processes and resources. Okay, and I got my one minute, so I'm gonna fly through uh, a few other projects. This is Des Bathke, plotter drawings, thinking about princesses and coloring books. Um, in the center is Katie Shearer, thinking about um, augmented reality experiences. April Topham, doing, uh, that's a, like a processing uh, drawing tool layered into a painting. And James Olson doing work kind of like this. Um, I think this is my most important slide, so I'll get through this and I'll get out of your way. Um, this, is, this is the thing I am learning as, as I've built this project. Um, and at some point, I feel like I became the establishment, and I'm not sure as an art student when that happened. Um, but if you ask um, the, the folks in the office, my administrators, what a technology program should do, they tell me design thinking, internships, coding, 21st century workforce development, right? Industry partnerships, um, interdisciplinary, whatever that means. Um, but when you ask my students, they think that we should be talking about things like cyborg fem feminism, mental health awareness, sustainable technology. Um, all my students have decided new materialism is like the thing right now. Um, they're making augmented reality artworks. They're interested in issues of privilege, accessibility, information security, and surveillance. Um, so I suppose I have no answers, but my question for you, um, and the thing I'd love to hear more from you about later, is how it is we sort of sustain this subculture when the funding is coming from this dominant culture. Um, and I have plenty more to talk about if you're interested, but I'll, I'll give my space to the next speaker. Thank you very, very much for having me. Hi, my name is Arlene. Um, thank you for coming to our talk. We hope you will take. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my name is Arlene from Color Coded. Uh, thank you for coming to our talk. We hope that you can take away something here. Here's some stats from Google's workforce from 2018. And we're still seeing these stats show that the tech industry is still very white and male dominated. Although some tech companies will boast about their diversity and inclusion departments much hasn't changed in the last few years. The only thing we're seeing in tech companies is a change is in their diversity statements on their websites. Business running as usual, white and male. Although diversity is supposed to mean better teams for tech, as well as an in turn diversity inclusion efforts target BIPOC, that means black indigenous people of color, by promising them they can easily switch from any career path into tech. All it takes is the time, dedication, and money to join a boot camp to learn the necessary technology to go into the tech field. 
The investment in BIPOC folks make in tech to level up their education by joining boot camps or accelerator programs is meant to give high returns for the high cost because if you don't learn tech, now you'll be left behind. We want to cancel all of this. We want BIPOC collectives. <laughs> we are a BIPOC collective of artists, programmers, activists, educators that formed out of a growing dissolution of business as usual in our chosen fields. Hi, my name is Aya. Um, one reason Color Coded started was because uh, we believe that technology is not um, neutral. By that we mean that tech is created by real people, which shapes what is created, and it really matters who is and isn't in the room when these technologies are being created. We acknowledge that everything is by design. Um, the way the world exists today is intentional and not by accident. We believe we have the power within ourselves to design it differently. To do so, we believe that we need to embody abolition which means challenging the belief that caging and controlling people makes us safe. Um, we must dismantle white and male dominant spaces. We must clearly define an ethical framework for collective organizing, our process for creating non-extractive, non-exploitive, and collaborative workflows, and our model for engaging directly impacted community members uh, community members in the design process from brainstorming to testing to final production in order to build many worlds. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Chris. Do I have to use the microphone? Hi, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm one of the co founders of Color Coded. Um, and I also, it's kind of nice to be here because uh, I learned how to program um, in processing. So it's like 10 years ago uh, or something like that. Yeah, so it's an interesting full circle thing. Um, but anyways, um, so Color Coded started about three years ago um, in the spring of 2015. We were like three members just getting to know each other, um, teaching each other how to code, but also how to organize. Um, so initially our learning together was project-based. Uh, we developed um, what we called Locales, uh, which was a showcase of locally owned mom and pop businesses run by people of color um, in LA. We also worked on ideas for a vendor alert system. Um, this was before street vending was like finally legalized in LA. Um, it was gonna be like a simple system to alert vendors uh, whenever uh, city sweeps were happening um, by cops. Um, in 2016, we got a studio, woohoo, in uh, Boyle Heights, where we started to host monthly community tech workshops and free office hours. Um, in 2017, uh, we were asked to create a website for a local worker center uh, servicing car wash workers. And so we came up with uh, what we called Practica, which is our apprenticeship model where some of our members with uh, less web design experience had an opportunity to work on a, a basically a real world project and level up their skills and they got paid to learn in the process, which is pretty cool. Uh, 2018, we continued experimenting with pedagogical models. Um, we got a couple of grants to develop Practica um, into what we're calling labs. Um, and folks are reaching out to work with us, like we're for hire, basically. <laughs> um, we, we also, we didn't put this down, but we attended a, um, a co-op class. So we're actually, we're working together as a cooperative, as a worker cooperative. So we're a collective and a cooperative. Um, and we did a class with a uh, shout out to LA Co-op Lab and LA Trade Tech. Um, at the end of 2018. That was, I think that really got us thinking about like self-sustaining um, and really changed change the game for like, we don't need to depend on grants and sponsorships and stuff like that. Um, so at the end of 2018, we grew from nine members to 11, uh, strong going into 2019. Hi, my name is Ashley. Uh, what we learned along the way is to practice asking questions about what we're using design and technology for, how we're using these tools, and why we're using them. Are we centering the lived experiences, needs, and creativity of our communities? Are we exchanging knowledge in ways that encourage collaboration regardless of education or expertise? Are we working to uplift each other and build up collective power? So we learn to consider how does tech education include or exclude who gets to participate in learning and building tech? How do we support the labor of teaching? 
We've learned that our communities can't afford debt-free tech education in the form of degree programs and boot camps. So we've been wondering, how might we practice a way of teaching tech that encourages people to show up with their whole selves? How might we practice building and owning tech that is consentful, sustainable, and planet and people-powered? How, um, so basically we've created hashtag level up LA trainings. Back to me. Um, so level up LA trainings um, is a series of short classes for small cohorts, I can never say that word, um, of community members to learn the skills they need to build the tech that they want to see. So we got stuff, uh, we offer trainings in design, uh, like lessons in typography, image making, uh, designing narratives, uh, mapping design experiences. Um, and I can say that we're, we're bringing in a lot from, I worked in a startup for a little while and so did another member. So we're bringing in a lot from the tech industry, but also organizing <laughs> and also education and act, you know, arts backgrounds um, and was specifically like de decolonizing <laughs> um, all of that. So it's like, I feel like what we're, the way we're doing it is not something you can get in a university, I don't think. Um, but we're committed to design justice, which centers people who are normally marginalized by design. Um, we're also doing uh, kind of web development fundamentals like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, maybe we'll do processing. Um, and uh, deep dives into how da databases work, um, how to translate your product ideas into a tech project so that you can start building with whatever resources are available. Um, our trainings are community centric, so some courses are, devel are devoted to building infrastructures uh, to support local community organizing efforts, um, learn how to fundraise um, using digital tools, um, learn how to build uh, databases so that you can stay in touch with your community effectively and uh, quickly and securely. Um, is that you? Oh, okay. Um, our trainings are affordable, so they're about 10% of uh, what boot camps cost. Um, they're flexible, so we know a lot of folks are working full time supporting families and have any number of side hustles. So they're designed to fit into busy schedules. And they're also uh, safe spaces for historically marginalized communities to learn together. So we value difference, whether that's racial background, gender, learning styles, abilities, languages, and uh, different accessibility needs. Uh, what happens in POC spaces? Anything we want. This is the beauty of them. So we are creating for us, by us. Um, the next one, sorry. Beyond diversity, that one's a little tricky. We see a lot of diversity and inclusion in different industries and tech. We want it. We as tokenizing and exploitive. We want to move beyond diversity and real steps to reparations for systematic inequalities like the racial wealth gap that have been created over centuries of racist policies in this country. Hashtag level up LA. If we want, um, Mia Minga says, if we want other people to do their work with their people, then we must do work with our people as well. We're rooted in LA, so we want to build alongside our community and help fo our folks realize it. We want to give back to our community as well. So if you are interested in the trainings, we're almost close to our getting our cohort as well. And if you, you can visit us at colorcoded.la slash trainings. Here's a picture of us in our last winter retreat. This is all of our members. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. While we're switching speakers, like, thank you so much. That was incredible. Pardon, I'm, I'm like, have to, I don't want anyone to see my, my processing email. <laughs> oh, where is it? There we go. I think we'd like to try this work. I, I opened it up. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's sweet. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we have the link. Do you want to close it, Renata? Just in no, no, no. If, you, if you get the link, then I can.
Should I just start? One thing about Color Coded, I want to share their uh, Twitter handle for folks. It's at Color Coded LA, so C O L O R C O D E D L A. Um, all right, thanks so much everyone for having me here. My name is An Xiaomina, and um, I just came from uh, City Hall um, for as a, a documenting the Women's March, and I've been uh, photographing it since, uh, since uh, DC in 2017. And I think what's so interesting, um, uh, so I have a book that just came out called Memes to Movements, is just how much memes show up in, um, in the protest signs. And it's a great illustration from 18 Million Rising that shows all the different types of, of like, phrases and sayings that initially started as hashtags or as memes memes, um, hashtag Black Lives Matter, or that they were remixes of original ones, like hashtag MAGA became um, immigrants make America great, right? And so um, you have like kind of all the aspects of meme culture um, being expressed over the past three years in different signs and physical space. And, and so much of what the Women's Marches and contemporary protests is about is about negotiating physical space and digital space and getting messages out in different ways. Um, and when you think about what makes them effective, right, what makes these messages effective is uh, the fact that they're repeated so often, the fact that they're uh, strong visual um, elements or appeals to identity, strong emotions. And I was reading, um, uh, you, you think that this has nothing to do with disinformation, uh, the, with kind of the growing awareness of, uh, of kind of this, this kind of post-truth society we're entering. Um, but actually, I want to argue today that they're actually intimately intertwined and that part of radical pedagogy is, is actually studying um, how disinformation works. Um, I was reading a report um, by Claire Wardle and Hossein Darakshan for the Council of Europe. It's called Information Disorder, and it's specifically about how disinformation works. And one of the things they said is that disinformation works because of strong repetition, strong narrative, strong visuals, strong emotion, appeal to identity. The very things that, um, that are harming um, our kind of notions of truth and notions of understanding um, are the same methods that are being used by progressive movements, by journalists today, to shape media environments and shape narratives. And so the trickiest thing that we're in right now, and it's kind of the first point I want to make, is that the things that are influencing kind of the way, the, the kind of our values and our perspectives in the world can be used for harm or for benefit for society. And that's studying um, disinformation, studying the things that uh, we think of as, as distanced from, um, from movements that are, that are bringing benefits to society, is one way to understand contemporary media influence today. Um, and so, um, uh, so that's the first point I want to make. The second one is this, is that so much of movements today are engaging with uh, physical space, or engaging with what, um, with also with the digital, right? And so in the book, I talk about this concept of a digital plaza, um, that plazas um, often are um, you know, physical, right? They're, they're spaces of contention, um, but so are the digital ones. Um, and it's through, um, through the digital spaces, though, that their different politics are enacted. Um, if you're in City Hall, you see police, and they're there largely coordinating things off, right? They're, they're there to, um, to, um, to block off spaces so that people can march. But different physical spaces have different kind of relationships to politics. Um, if you go to Tiananmen Square, if you go to the Zocalo in Mexico City, if you go to the National Mall, if you look at the history of how public space has been negotiated in the U.S., the police have not always been uh, so friendly, right? Um, and so all of our f digital spaces and our physical spaces have politics, which movements and, and people messaging um, have to negotiate. And so for those of us here who are engaging in coding, right, who are building digital spaces, um, the second point I want to make is to think about the politics that you are building into your digital spaces. We talked about the internet as a space that would democratize expression. But none of the spaces that we've seen so far that have been very popular have any of the kind of hallmarks of democracy. Systems of accountability, systems of representation, systems of, um, of, uh, uh, of transparency and accountability, right? Um, most of our digital spaces today operate on systems of, of capital and attention. And so movements and media have to negotiate for attention and it's basically about who is the loudest voice. And so as we're thinking about our digital plazas, what are the new modes um, of building our tools and building our spaces that can be more in service of democracy rather than um, kind of attention economics? And so the final point I want to make um, is, um, is, how many of you have Twitter? Um, if you open up Twitter right now, uh, take a look at what's trending, just like, like literally right now, uh, worldwide or USA. 
Some of the big hashtags trending right now are two. Um, one is Women's March 2019. The other one is MAGA. This is a good example of the, the moment we're in right now. Um, we are in a moment of narrative contention. We talk about the death of truth, but it's actually more of a death of consensus. And I emphasize consensus because um, it's a social mechanism by which we negotiate truth and value that are being called into question. Is this a country where um, we want to make things great again, just like in the past? Are we drawing from Reaganism, from the history of the United States um, that, that, um, that we understand to be great? Or is this a, a country where, we're, um, where it's, it's grounded in women's rights, in queer movements, in, in racial justice movements? This is the moment we're in right now. Um, and the third point I want to make is this, is that understanding how um, the truth is negotiated now, how values are negotiated through digital spaces, is absolutely critical and vital. And right now, it's based largely on attention economics and who can trend the, the biggest hashtag. Um, and um, if we are not more conscientious about the spaces we're building, and the different ways through which we build media and build power, um, um, I'm afraid that only the largest voices and those with more access to money and power are going to win. So studying this um, is probably the most radical thing we can do. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the technical, technical difficulty. That was some old slides that I had or something else. Um, my talk is about introducing um, how paradigms are informed, um, how we talk about uh, things that seem daunting to learn at first, such as machine learning or um, neural networks uh, and natural language processing. Um, like when I say this out loud, uh, these were things that I thought that I wouldn't be able to understand realistically um, within like two years of learning coding or like even four years. Um, but I found that uh, the discussions surrounding these terms um, are lacking a perspective from like the humanities and of course like interdisciplinary um, views for kind of complicating the discussions around them. Um, so one thing that I kind of wanted to look at in particular is the term sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is inter interesting to me because it's kind of the science around quantifying um, things like emotions, quantifying um, desires or anticipations, which on paper seems really, really difficult to do. Um, even thinking of condensing something as complex as that, um, part of it seems like a really interesting design challenge. It's enticing on one hand, and on the other hand, it seems insurmountable in a way. Um, in conversations where you're getting relevant feedback, where you feel empathized with, where you feel like the other person is present, um, that's not a conversation where you're actively thinking about the quantification of those elements of the conversation, right? Um, 
But if you think about this as a design question, as opinion mining, as something where uh, we're trying to predict the emotional responses we get from certain types of words um, to solicit responses in that way, we begin to work into something that is closer to psychology called appraisal theory. And so already like the lines are blurring between those two concepts. Um, something that's very core to natural language processing. So this is a really inter interesting example of how natural language processing manifests in the real world. Um, X2AI is uh, a company, I believe, opened in 2016. Um, their flagship product was TESS. Um, this is an image from their public tech demo, which you can find on Vimeo. Um, TESS was developed to be a kind of on-the-fly <laughs> psychoanalyst. Um, she delivers cognitive behavioral therapy um, for you, like, on your cell phone or, um, you know, through whatever, like, way you want to get it. Like, I think there was also, um, like, a flavor of TESS that ran on Facebook, which is really problematic because Facebook owns all your data. So, um, like, any, uh, like, legal um, kind of protections that you would have if you were seeing a licensed psychotherapist privately, obviously that doesn't fly. Like, if you're using it on Facebook, um, there is no um, privacy there, which is really interesting. And um, something else, you know, while I was researching Tess and how natural language process processing is used for um, her kind of natural flow of conversation, I found that Tess was being used um, to treat Syrian refugees. Um, part of the reason why uh, X2AI began, began, <laughs> began to monetize this, um, this product is according to them, they were closing the gap between um, a lack of like licensed psychotherapists for Syrian refugees, um, the fact that they didn't have access to healthcare in a lot of cases, um, and while they are, you know, decidedly doing that and providing that, um, it's coming at the cost of humanity and um, feeling like you're being witnessed, which is a huge part of psychotherapy, in my opinion. Um, this is actually um, a comment that comes from Wobot, which <laughs> is very similar to um, Tess, um, in that it's a chatbot that delivers um, cognitive behavioral therapy um, to its clients, usually via mobile. Um, and okay, one of the comments is, I hated using emojis to describe how I feel. This is kind of shorthand for explaining why these interactions might be frustrating for people who are actually looking for psychological help. Um, it, you don't, if you're not being seen, if you're not having an interaction that feels personal, um, and uh, obviously, like, you don't want to shorthand your emotions into something that becomes like a caricature of yourself. Um, I mean, we, we know why this is problematic or why it could be difficult for, for some people to adopt chatbots in that way. Um, sorry, let me gain my thoughts again. Um, if we want to realistically bridge this um, mental health care gap with chatbots, I think we have to reevaluate how we're using um, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. It's not a panacea. Um, part of the reason why it fits so perfectly into natural language processing is because it's so formulaic. Um, I was talking to someone about this and they said that it's kind of um, like owning yourself with facts. Like it's very, like you, you have a very um, rigid kind of set of uh, like rules or um, ways of thinking of your own mentality, it's very um, structured. And so this translates perfectly for code. You just give it um, like certain keywords, like you train it to uh, search for words like, you know, I'm not feeling good or bad or like looking for question marks, things that are totally ripped out of context of an actual conversation of how you're feeling. Um, and in a way, it parrots back to you those sentiments and then will like send you t to a link to like a video for like a five minute um, like self-care thing where you just like breathe for five minutes. So it's, it seems, it can be effective, but 
qualitatively, it's probably not the best thing. Um, okay, now I'm trying to <laughs> moving a little bit more into actual machine learning proper. Um, uh, these are three images which are pretty jarring to look at. Um, the first one has a caption that says, a woman riding a horse on a dirt road. Second one, an airplane is parked on the tarmac at an airport. Third, a group of people standing on top of the beach. I mean, obviously, <laughs> these are all lacking um, social context, like historical awareness. Um, what they're lacking is empathy, right? But if we're seeing like, like the strict facts of it, it's not necessarily wrong. <laughs> it is hitting all of the landmarks that it's supposed to be seeing, right? Um, it is seeing a woman riding a horse. It is seeing an airplane in tarmac. And it is seeing a group of people on a beach. Um, this is kind of, uh, I mean, of course, like this model isn't like the best model to be showing. I'm sure there's ones that are more accurate for the images that they're looking for. But this is just an, an extreme example of how, um, you know, words don't really like link up with what we think machines are seeing or like the narratives that we like to say about machine intelligence, right? It's not always as um, straightforward as like, yes, it, it, it identifies what it sees, it knows what it means. Um. Oh my goodness, okay, sorry. I have a lot of more content, but we're gonna mash it down into one minute. Um, I wanted to kind of, <laughs> like look away from machine learning and look toward um, the way that biases are replicated through um, natural language processing. We're using like a huge corpus of text. So for example, um, if you're doing a machine learning model where uh, you want it to comb common web pages or you're using something that only looks at Google News, um, things like word to vec and Glove do this. Um, they, they they're just a mirror for us. Any bias that people have already in those articles, which is plenty, they're just gonna shoot it ba right back at us. It's not making an objective reading of anything, really, um, unless you artificially weight it to do that. And it won't do that by itself unless like, you, you literally artificially go in and change it. Um, it won't just work that way automatically. Um, this is, these are just examples of um, extreme gender stereotypes um, where this, the gender isn't orthographic to the language, meaning it's not mechanically built in, such as words like sister or brother. Um, these are ones where gender is implied, but of course, like the gender shouldn't really mean anything. Um, this is another example of it, very mechanical. Um, ones where gender would be appropriate would be like sister, brother, mother, father or something, but um, when it starts making analogies between things that are like thought of to be feminine versus masculine, um, you see like none of those things should really have any gendered color to them, but they end up doing that anyway. Um. Oh man, <laughs> so just to, in the next 30 seconds, I'm not gonna go through how this works, um, but I, I'm in the radical pedagogy track because I believe, similar to the other talks before me, that in order to like make any real lasting changes on these biases for systems that we believe to be objective just because they're machines, but they're not, um, we sometimes we do have to like artificially reweight them, meaning um, directing them in ways to like literally rip out the gender that it's seeing, or if not doing that, um, you know, putting in like artificial like stop gaps so that it's able to make you know, opinions for itself that maybe reflect a better politic or something. Um, anyway, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for coming and thank you to all of our speakers. The talks were amazing. Can we just get one more like show of support? And we did start a little bit late, so sorry if you didn't get a coffee break. But uh, Epic Play is starting soon, so I'm gonna hand the mic over, and yeah.
Thank you so much.
Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with the Epic Play Lightning Talks in just a few minutes. So if you all want to grab coffee and settle, we'll get started soon. Thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so we're gonna get started with the uh, Epic Play track. I just wanted to thank the speakers for the track, uh, Saskia, Kristen, Adele, Michael, and Edom. It's really um, a group of people whose work and practices and lives that I adore, so I'm really happy to have them all together. So um, Saskia's up, thank you. Can I change the slides uh, thing? Because I don't see my notes uh, now. It's gonna, yeah, it's. Uh, yes, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Saskia. Um, 
Um, it's great to be here and to meet everyone. Uh, I also want to thank the Creative Industry Fund Enel for uh, getting me here to uh, Los Angeles. So I will talk about uh, play every day. Uh, since the start of 2015, and I have We do it with, uh, with this, cool. Um, so, sorry. Um, since the start of uh, 2015, I've been creating uh, one digital artwork every single day. Um, it started with um, the, the main three teams that I'm kind of making are uh, patterns, animations, and um, uh, as well, uh, kind of shapes that are similar as patterns. And the main theme that I'm uh, using is using uh, geometric shapes to make interesting compositions. Um, I kind of uh, use different drawing software and coding software, but over the years, my main focus became using code to create these things. Last year, in 2018, I only used uh, processing to make my uh, daily artworks. So that's kind of my main sketching tool. So how I see uh, doing this daily is kind of uh, about playing with rules. Uh, and the rules uh, that are rules that I create, uh, nobody tells me what kind of rules I need to use, but they give me some kind of uh, um, structure to play within. Um, so the rules can be about something I use. It can be about, oh, I'm kind of focusing on using 3D shapes or 2D shapes. It can be about colors. It can be about which program I'm using. So all these rules kind of change over time in what I want to do. Um, some rules always are there. There's one rule that I do this daily, uh, and that gives me kind of something, um, uh, a, a good rule to create stuff. Um, but as well, these daily artworks don't have to be uh, a new, different kind of thing uh, than the previous day. I really like exploring making iterations on the same rules that I'm using. So here you can see three of the similar um, uh, things I made uh, three days in a row and kind of looking what I can change just a little bit to make something different. And even with this small play and iteration, you kind of explore different things. Uh, last year, I focused on uh, doing monthly teams. So I had kind of a month, kind of a structure, a certain set of rules that I would explore in what can I make in this set of rules. Um, one thing, it helps to kind of focus because you kind of, uh, are, you know what you are doing, um, but as well as it's a challenge to think about something new and try something new every day. Uh, this year, I'm kind of uh, going to weekly themes, so I have a little bit more freedom to switch uh, in different kind of things that I want to explore. Um, so with these rules that can be as well kind of challenges, if I want to start exploring something new, if I'm getting bored, I want a certain challenge. Uh, here you can see uh, a month with, I did last year, I think in October, and only using Unicode characters to uh, make these patterns. Uh, and that's something to kind of get out of my comfort zone as well, to think about how I can come up with new things to uh, also enjoy myself in creating these things. 
um, it's a great tool to kind of learn every day a little bit. And sometimes I'm, I'm kind of scared to start something new and it has to be good enough. Uh, but I think uh, in 2017, I already had like long idea, oh, I need to start using 3D shapes. I need to do something, but I didn't have time to really explore how I gonna use it. Uh, so I just started with looking up what kind of shape, uh, what 3D shape it is, and these are the first three 3D kind of animations um, that aren't that pretty yet, uh, but in a few days you kind of learn a little bit more, you learn a bit about lighting, and you kind of find ways to, to make it better. So sometimes you don't need to know everything to just start something. Um, and in, in this learning and in this play, uh, sometimes it's really nice, but there are also really uneasy moments and uncomfortable moments when you try something new and it doesn't work and you're kind of trying to figure it out. And it can be about programming or uh, kind of structure you want to do or even color, uh, trying to come up with different colors to use. Um, so in this play, it's also really important to kind of find these moments of un, uh, uncomfortable situations to kind of let yourself grow in, in um, uh, exploring uh, and, and also it's a way to come to new ideas. Uh, and when you kind of find a nice thing, you want to explore more and then you have time to play with it and try a lot of things. Um, and what I said with iterations, it's really interesting to um, to, to focus on structures and see what you can make more of it. And in that way, with playing around, you come as well to new ideas um, you want to create. So doing this daily and uh, in the start, it wasn't really easy. It was really hard to kind of start and really force myself to create something and especially to upload it uh, on internet to see, uh, to let everyone see. But now it has become like a really nice flow and something um, I can go uh, to, to just um, play around. And what I said earlier, these are my own rules. So it's my own thing where I can explore in and nobody tells me what to do. So it's kind of my little time to play. Um, and I think every day you kind of find inspiration and uh, from all different kind of things. Uh, and it's a nice way to use that inspiration to create something that day. And it can be inspiration such as color, um, uh, but well, uh, previous work could be really interesting to look at what you made before, how can I use that, uh, and also uh, uh, kind of combine things you, you use from yourself. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's also kind of, a relaxed way, it's kind of escape the day. Uh, I mostly do it in the evening um, or just uh, at the end of the work day. Uh, and it just gives me this break to kind of be free in what I want to explore, to create something. Uh, and, and yeah, nobody tells me what to do. So it's kind of a relaxed way to explore. Uh, and as well, I think uh, the animations can be as well really meditative to look at. Um, so I think um, it's really important to, to kind of force yourself in the beginning to play and, and to create something. Um, and um, I had written something good, but <laughs> I don't know. It. Um, so I, I think if you, if you find as well uncomfortable situations in, in this play, uh, you, have, you have space to kind of grow and it doesn't have to be perfect every day. Uh, it's, it's about learning and creating kind of space for yourself to, to uh, have, have it as a creative outlet uh, and learn uh, something new. Uh, thank you. All right, so next we have Kristen McQuarter.
Hello. Uh, I'm Krista McWhorter. I'm an artist, and I work largely at the intersection of performance and object making. And today I'm going to talk about party games, um, and specifically speculative models for play by working with form. Um, when I say party games, I'm often thinking about these like strange um, objectives that we try to achieve at moments of coming of age, birthdays, retirement parties, graduations, um, and that these activities are often centered around what seems like nonsense, but is always um, incorporating our bodies in some kind of embarrassing or um, confusing, difficult way. Um, and I find these party games or these rituals that come around parties really interesting in that they're often somewhere between fun and joyous, but also abusive, like spitting in each other's faces, blindfolding each other and spinning each other around, making ourselves so dizzy that we're sick, or singing really loudly in a way that we know will make people turn red in the face. Um, and I like to try to think about what is happening in these moments. Are we trying to humble figures of authority? Are we trying to find heroes within systems um, that are designed to make us fail? Are we trying to renegotiate the social contracts that we exist within? And why is it that parties tend to be the space where this happens? Um, in particular, I'm interested in the ways that by putting our, ooh, there's a pinata getting torn apart in this other one. Um, but the, when we are using our bodies in ways that we don't expect to be using our bodies, how this creates space for speculative behaviors that are renegotiating our social contracts. So bobbing for apples is a great example of we don't ever use our bodies in that way except for under these circumstances. I don't know what we're learning when we're bobbing for apples, but it seems to be something worth doing um, repeatedly such that it becomes a cultural event. Well, in my practice over the past several years, I've found that I tend to use these, um, the material language of these party events um, like in a few different occasions, and as well as the um, kind of constructs of these party games um, as a sort of choreography for performance. And what I'm interested in is how these types of scenarios bring to a head our desire for intimacy and our desire for competition simultaneously. Um, and that speculative space that exists between those two behavior sets becomes a really provocative um, place for me to speculate on new behaviors or systems of behavior. And recently I've been looking into how these different speculative models of behavior could um, interface with digital or virtual spaces. Um, and so first thing I like to look at is sort of the objects that accompany our digital and virtual spaces, keyboards, game controllers, virtual reality headsets, and what are the embodied behaviors that accompany those. Um, so for example, a game controller, even though there's a lot of facility in how much instructions you're able to provide to a game system through uh, the dexterity of your fingers, say, is also putting the rest of your body into an embodied experience of having your hands bound together. And so as we're playing games, what is the embodied knowledge that is accompanying our gameplay when we're bound by the wrists? And a lot of times I think we like to think of virtual spaces as sort of these disembodied experiences that send us off into the ether. Um, but there's this uncanny valley I think that we're always confronted with where we live and exist inside of our bodies. And so 
there's a frustration for me between the physical objects of our gameplay and the kind of embodied experiences we're trying to achieve. So I've been looking at taking virtual reality headsets and reconfiguring the haptic feedback that comes with them through the physical form of how they manifest. Um, so this project, XXLXX, is five virtual reality headsets in which the focal points for each headset can um, pull the viewers into different directions. So there's a competitive model of pulling against four other viewers in order to assert the focal point that you want to have inside your virtual space. And similarly, this piece, um, Scope, is an uh, underwater um, trippy experience um, that you have in virtual reality, but as you're rigidly tied to another viewer, um, which mirrors the vir virtual experience inside. Huddle is a piece that takes, I think, six different viewers um, and puts them into a contraption where they are there's a mirroring between the huddle of the content inside the virtual space and the behaviors that they share with other viewers. And when I'm making these, I'm thinking a lot about this um, interface between the virtual and the physical space, and so where these seams are met. Um, and so really thinking about the joints of the body and how those are directly connecting to the physics engine inside the game space. So if we think about the articulation of our body as having cause and effect inside of the virtual spaces, we can think of um, hinge joints, pivot joints, ball and sockets, springs, et cetera, as also existing in the physical world. Um, so our neck, our wrists, our knees, our shoulders, these are all also part of the game space. So recently I've been prototyping different kinds of party games like Bobbing for Apples or Pin the Tail on the Donkey into virtual reality games um, and creating the virtual reality headsets to be the decorations of the party. So that the virtual reality headsets are animated by the playing of the game. And I'm hoping that this is sort of creating a speculative space to uh, think through how is this kind of gameplay changing our social contract. And by speculating on the different ways that we might be um, negotiating these games or negotiating these party environments, um, it's also a question of, you know, how do we um, relate ourselves next to ideas of courtship, competition, celebration, birthdays, and the different rituals that accompany those. Thank you. So next up, we have Adele Lin. This little dance is getting your slides up. Um, this one. Oops. I did too early. Cool. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm so overwhelmed. Uh, being able to be here and um, seeing all my friends and uh, this lovely community that has blossomed over um, so many years. Uh, I'm here to today to talk about um, a project uh, that I uh, built uh, with, with a team of people at uh, Burning Man last year called, um, uh, you know, it's called a Cloud Machine. 
And um, what I really love about today is um, how uh, the community makes something and then comes out and talks about it. And my practice is um, really taking that kind of like maker um, um, element to it. So when I build something, I, I just love to share the process. And so a lot of what I'm talking about today is how we broke the project down and, and um, um, how things were built. Uh, so my name is Adele, um, Adele Lin. Uh, I have uh, kind of poorly documented projects all over the place, um, mostly at these couple of websites, and also my code is um, uh, on my GitHub, also with the same name. Uh, yeah, so I'm a designer turned engineer, and uh, for my personal work, I love um, creating playful universes um, and environments and collaborating with people um, in a way where um, um, people can connect and learn something about themselves and each other. Uh, so some of the projects that I've uh, built in the past, uh, this one um, over here is a game called Star Catcher, where uh, you, you walk into a club, uh, field of stars, and you have some nets, and basically you catch stars. Um, project up there next to it um, is this notion of augmented reality um, amulets, but kind of using these amulets um, that hold um, your superpower and that gets um, visualized um, in, in AR. Uh, there's another project where I, I brought some unicorns to the desert. Um, down there is in Times Square uh, where we had a picnic with um, connected musical mushrooms. And um, the project uh, to the right of that is also another uh, musical uh, little village that I, I tried to build um, in Berlin a few years ago. Uh, and those two um, images on the far side uh, are the um, two other communities that I'm um, involved in. One is Code Liberation, where we teach women to code for games and creative um, endeavors. And then uh, that's NYC Resistor, uh, which is my beloved hackerspace in New York. Uh, yeah, so uh, this project is called Ethereal Fleeting. Uh, it was conceived by three artists in um, Switzerland, uh, Lucas, Itamar, and Bruce. Um, they helped me with a project a few years ago, and so when they, they, they told me about this project and asked if I'd love to be if I'd like to be involved, I was I was really excited. There were um, there were just so many things that I, I liked about this notion of um, uh, building a cloud canopy that that people could um, could hang out under. Uh, and one thing is this notion of um, bringing the skies closer and help help us get closer to nature, um, and there was something very playful about this this idea that um, I, I wanted to engage with. Um, this is one of the larger, small projects that I've, I've uh, embarked on, um, kind of meaning I've worked on projects where it's involved two people up to like maybe 100 people where um, someone's job is just to press the button that drops the curtain. Uh, and those you know, projects are of a totally different scale where um, you might not even know half the functions of, of the other people um, on the team. Uh, so this was a project maybe about 10 people and um, and so it's a, ni a nice scale to kind of talk about. So um, I want to talk about a few things about how you collaborate with um, people across different um, parts of the world, um, how you break down a project that has a physical build as well as um, some digital elements, and um, also some of the specifics um, about pro programmable um, effects. Uh, so this was a really interesting collaboration because I was in uh, San Francisco on the, on the West Coast and um, I had a collaborator in New York and then um, also the guys were in Switzerland and Paris. So most of our meetings were me holding a coffee cup and, and they were holding beers. Uh, so, you know, it's a very different dynamic there. And also um, physical geography can um, dictate the roles uh, that you end up taking with the project. So I wasn't physically able to be part of the building prototypes. So I, I took on the role of um, coding and, and some of the electronics. So the project had um, a pretty quick timeline. Um, this, we, kn we knew about the funding in February, but then things only really started going up in July. And we were gonna do our first build in um, sort of build with everybody on site a month after that, and then um, the project had to be up at the end of August. So a lot of time was spent before that, mainly um, scheduling and thinking about documentation and communicating and figuring out how to communicate over the internet. 
so there was a lot of uh, visual um, uh, visual assets that were being built. So some were um, more around the physical build, what what that was going to look like, um, rendering, trying to get the proposal, and um, and early prototypes where we started with wood um, and it ended up being kind of using uh, metal in the end. So the, si the system involved uh, a few of these towers um, that they were all going to be networked together with uh, Ethernet, um, Cat5. And uh, so you had the main tower, which had also the brain elements, um, which had a Raspberry Pi, um, a switch, um, it was going to have some sensors in it, which we didn't end up being able to incorporate. And then uh, you had all these nodes, which were uh, consisting of microcontrollers. We used um, Teensies, which are a really great um, uh, little controller that uh, could pass through um, the different types of messaging to um, the lighting, um, to the fog machines that we ended up using, um, and different uh, other floodlights and things like that. <coughs> so this, this for me, since I wasn't, um, since I wasn't the uh, final kind of, um, I was trying to realize um, uh, somebody's vision. This was a really nice opportunity for me to think about how can I build something that uh, somebody else could then use to build with. And so I was kind of thinking about how do you make a playground uh, for someone, uh, a coding playground for someone to play with um, in two to three days when we were all gonna get together. So a lot of my thinking around it was um, developing for another developer, which is um, interesting for me. So it's um, kind of thinking through a few different types of systems, and this was kind of the one that we ended up going through, uh, going with, uh, where we had all the different types of patterns and uh, effects that we wanted, um, thinking through the pixel mapping, um, and then how we were then going to pass on those messages um, and passing all the data out through to all the other um, controllers. Um, so we ended up using, so um, with this kind of work, um, if um, uh, many of you who engage with this know that there are other tools um, that you can use, uh, like MaxMSP, Touch Designer, um, you know, doing it straight with uh, Python. Um, but we ended up going with processing, and um, it was, uh, there are many reasons why, and one of it was like, it's a really great collaborative tool. Um, and the other thing I love about it is it's totally cross-platform. So we were able to, um, each of us develop in our own environments, Mac and Windows, and then we were able to put it on a Linux machine and have it um, you know, sit out there for a week and, and it, it just ran perfectly. So um, you know, when, you're, when you're thinking through these sorts of projects, thinking, you know, thinking about what kind of hardware are you gonna have, like uh, an expensive machine with a GPU, or you know, is it gonna be on a little embedded computer and you know, kind of think through what environment you want to build um, your, your projects in. Uh, and uh, yeah, just uh, so um, another peculiarity of uh, using, um, of doing kind of lighting control is there's a, there's a few different protocols. Um, there's one called Open Sound Control, OSC, um, and um, Artnet uh, DMX, which is more for artists. Um, there are different protocols that architectural lighting uses, but these, these are generally the ones that you um, you would be working with for art projects. And um, so um, Artnet is this, um, it's kind of like a distribution system that um, sends out DMX data. And um, getting to understand that at, at the beginning was a really tricky thing because you have these idea of universes which have um, channels in them. So um, a universe will have 512 channels which when you split them up to RGB, gives you 170.67 LEDs, which also doesn't really make sense. Um, so we had 7,200 LEDs, and then you had to think about how to split that into chunks of 512. Uh, so we ended up thinking through and, and working out some math, and we used less than the 512 channels. Um, and so just kind of have to get um, used to that if you're, if you're gonna be using this for your project. Uh, and then the other um, concept that um, here is this notion of a pixel map. So you, where you, um, so the top is actually the design or the kind of like the, the way the patterns were gonna be laid out on the different towers and structures, but then how you send that out on a, uh, on your DMX universe is kind of like the pixel map. 
and because there wasn't enough channels on one to send out the whole message, so I ended up having to chop it in half. And um, so that's kind of what it, what it looks like there. Uh, so this is early prototyping, um, just kind of using um, one of the basic processing sketches and, and using the ArtNet library to send that out. So I was testing on a single LED strip, and then I would send that code over to, um, to uh, Paris where they would test on, um, I think, 15 of them. Uh, so one of the main things was thinking about um, efficiency. Uh, once you start going up to a lot of um, strips, there's um, a lot of, we, we dropped a lot of frames. And so some of the things that helped were um, not to draw to the screen. Drawing to the screen takes up a lot of memory. And so I had to uh, you know, change all my code to write directly to the pixel buffer and just have like um, a tiny um, a drawing on screen just to show people what was going on. Um, and uh, then finally, finally, like a month, uh, two weeks before, well, we were going out and got to think about the fun stuff and how do you design for drama. And uh, in this situation, there was um, a lot of clocks involved. So um, thinking about um, each of the, the clouds being like a poof event, and those got clustered into fog events, um, and timing those, and then leading up to a fog event, you would have like these lighting pat, uh, design these lighting patterns that would um, um, lead up to it. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, just video of the, the final results. Um, it's really hard to film LEDs, as many of you will know, but you can see there's a little creeping pattern that goes up um, the sticks, and then you get this, this nice poof. Um, yeah, um, so um, anyway, I think I'm actually out of time, but um, thank you, thank you so much. And, And uh, yeah, if you're interested in looking at the code, um, you can just check that out on, on the GitHub and, and let me know if you have any questions or are building any similar projects. Thank you. All right, next up we have Patrick. <laughs> and you need this, I think. Yeah, I want to use that one. Hello. Hello. I gotta get a couple things real quick before I start. This will be handy at one point. So uh, here's a drawing that I made and I printed off enough copies for what I hope is everybody, but I hope to talk about this at some point. I hope to talk about this at some point. So I'm just gonna hand you the box and hope that it makes it to everybody. Fresh off the presses at FedEx Kinko's last night. They did not sponsor this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now that we're done with the intro, <laughs> I just figured I should rush through that to get to this. Um, so for about eight and a half years, there's about 90% of what I do, I never culminate into anything. And <laughs> this is uh, partially intentional because, you know, when I'm thinking about these caverns that are being explored, which no one has ever seen before, and the degrees to which some minerals grow when a loud space and lack of interaction in order to articulate themselves in new and strange ways, that that is beautiful to me and a metaphor that I think about in terms of what's going on inside of me. However, when it does come a time to have like say a nine minute window to present 90% of what you've done for the last eight and a half years, 
then you have to build some kind of architecture or framework to make that possible. And so I made this door. And this door is actually a door which I have built many times before in totally different ways, sometimes in different media, but it's always a tool for me to express something in relationship to. I think being here today, I'm very uh, interested in processing, programming, and these kinds of things in terms of the way that cognition works. And when I think about uh, what often we're kind of dealing with from a layman's perspective, in some of that is cause and effect. And I just love the idea that I can open the same door over and over and over again and watch it change with the grip of my hand, constantly pulling that lever, watch other people open it and see something completely different behind the door that I can't even see. And Patrick! Patrick! You guys heard that, right? Hi! Hi, Patrick! Oh, hey, it's, uh, it's my friend, Wall Friend. Uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, well, I'm kind of in the middle of a presentation right now. Oh, sorry. Well, it's actually kind of cool that you showed up because I think the last time I built this door, it was actually to a project that you were involved in. Oh, is this a uh, Forever House? Uh, yeah, this is actually, well, that was Forever House. This isn't Forever House. Yeah, this didn't look like it. Okay, so at one point I built an interactive maze room and uh, where in which I wrote a fantasy narrative and I played like 13 different characters using puppetry and trapdoors. Oh, are you saying I'm a puppet now? Just listen to me, well, friend, because it's the easiest way for me to communicate it to them, okay? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, Wallfriend was one of the characters in that narrative, and um, where he lived inside of this narrative was, it's kind of hard to describe. Well, let me take this one, I think I could describe it better. So, Imagine all the negative space in the architecture that you uh, inhabit, and I live in all of that space. Every place you can't access is where I live. Yes, and because there's only tiny little peepholes, I see some up there. Look, look up there. You can see like tiny little cracks in the architecture. Those are the places that I peek out of to interact with people. So actually, this seems like a lot of people all at once. <sighs> Do you ever get nervous, Patrick? I do actually get quite nervous before I talk, and I just kind of like sometimes have to do something at the beginning of a talk to kind of get all that energy out, you know? Oh, I totally understand. Oh, I'm kind of getting a little bit nervous right now. Okay, well, friend, what can we do for you? I just need a big flat plane to put my face against. Okay, uh, the, the floor. What's the floor? The floor, imagine it like a wall that extends across the entire globe and it's different textures all throughout the globe, right? Some are hard, some are soft, it's hard to explain, but I think you'll be fine there. Okay. Uh, so next up, I actually, oh, I keep putting it on and taking it off the thing in a, in a way that isn't really good. Uh, so next up, I actually, dealing with like multiple different processes that seem to be constantly competing for space in your life can make you feel like a lot of different selves. And uh, when I'm struggling to kind of like quell the tension between some of these selves, I need to also build tools so that I can feel the sense of being a singularity. And then sometimes that singularity, I realize, extends into the interconnectedness of everything. Anyways, I brought something today that could, that could kind of help me. It's this tube, and it has a one on it. All right.
Origin could be a tube between itself and its ghost. The lack of beginning was a death upon discovery, but was not is. Is is now, but is not beginning again. Distinction is adamant, but futile. Sustenance is life suckling backwards from the twin of origin. Lining up the beginning of eminence with its own contour holds the milk of hatred in its light. Only in darkness can destiny escape the pressure of definition. Definition beholden to separation. Separation beholden to the positive image of forms. Positivity beholden to an ignorance of absence. Ignorance beholden to positioning darkness against lightness. Darkness is the heart of nature's whole, turning all perceived inward, the inversion of knowable distance. Solace only in the light sheds none, for there is no sight in the loving gyre of undoing. All right, so we're gonna talk about that drawing. Do I have to, like maybe just like two more minutes to talk about the drawing? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna jump from that to the next thing real quick. Uh, one thing that has kind of culminated is in, the, in my process over the last eight and a half years, uh, there's also been another person that I am somewhat responsible, quite responsible for bringing into the world who is my son. A part of my process, which only culminates insofar as it's a constantly evolving thing between he and I, is that I've been shaping multiple narratives in relationship to him, different creation myths that I've come up with myself, or different kind of worlds that I thought of distinct. But within the last about three and a half years, I realized actually through this door that all of these narratives are merging. And that the next time this iterates, what you have on the paper there may be a completely different thing. But what you're looking at is a world that is called the Holocomb. It is a partial continent that has only been partially explored by a human colony that's tried to settle it twice. They're in their second attempt. And um, there's a circle on the paper. So that is a port town known as Risbane. And within Risbane, it kind of is this farming village that was formed because a bunch of uh, indentured servants basically said like, fuck you to the hierarchical monarch who was basically trying to kind of like stage that as the beginning of the political structure of, of the Holocomb human colony. And yeah, yeah, woo. And so uh, in this world, in Risbane, there's three different seasons as we would call them, but ways that they structure time in which different kind of global effects take place that seem like a kind of theater for emotions. And um, there's a time at the end of the third season that's known as Otopotodoki, in which uh, time just stops completely. It stops existing, it takes a rest. That's, what, that's how they conceive of it. They say time goes away. And during this time, all they do is uh, communal gatherings and different rituals for uh, uh, expressing their sense of their place in everything. And now this is particular to Risbane, and uh, whether or not it's related to the struggle that they faced against the original hierarchy, or uh, just out of the kind of way of tilling the land and watch each other build a community together, I don't know, I'm still exploring this place. But uh, I want to sing for you one of the songs they sing in Autopodadoki, and then that'll be it, okay? We are always we are never, we are the grain, we are weather, we are all, we are none. We are the grass grown green and the steam from the ground and the animals that drink from the streams unfound and the mist of the mountains in the early morning dew and the music in our heart that beats for me and you. And when we sing it so it's true. We are the sun, we are the moon, we are further, we are soon, we are all, we are none. We are mulch under meadows and the pulp and the petals and the flower and the trellis and the 
Bone skin and callus and the tool and the table and the tale, myth and fable and the music in our soul sung for me and you. And when we sing it so, it's true. Affirm our place in all anew. Thank you. completely different. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to quote Monty Python in here. So, so next up we have uh, Ido Stern. Thanks. Thanks for the show. It's great. Um, and it's not that far off from, I mean, it is, but it kind of relates to what I'm going to talk about, so I'm glad. Um, okay. Um, let's see. So, yeah, thanks for uh, um, having me. I'm excited to talk to everyone in this context. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today are uh, the challenges of building an institution nested within an institution, nested within an institution, and etc., cetera, uh, and preserving and sharing as many of the values as possible that um, I want to promote, and creating a space and a context for fertile creativity and experimentation within those nested institutions. Um, I'm going to talk about the UCLA Game Lab, which is uh, a nested institution. Um, it's up on the third floor. Um, this is the unwrapped version. It doesn't quite get that big in real life, but um, there's Tyler right there. Sometimes there's more people in there. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about kind of a little bit about the lab and how it's positioned um, in different ways. So uh, I like to think of a UCLA Game Lab as a kind of gray ops operation within uh, DMA, within UCLA, within um, the School of Arts and Architecture. Um, and these are a few of the values and ideas that guide the lab. Um, one is uh, it's important that the lab is public facing. A lot of uh, academic sub-institutions uh, slowly, if not at the onset, bubble into a kind of academic bubble and forget about public facedness. So I see the lab as very much a public facing institution. Um, we do a lot of shows uh, outside of this um, context geographically and also try to spread things out um, in the virtual world. Um, the lab is a place about art and experiences and experiments primarily. Um, I'm reluctant to call, the, the lab I would say, is reluctant to call everything that is done research uh, and conform to the disciplinary expectations um, 
that come with being a space inside of a research university. Um, a lot of art in these spaces gets called research to justify its existence, and I think this is a terrible disservice to um, what art and creativity can and should be. Um, and I think most importantly, by far, is the lab is a place to embrace multiple points of view simultaneously. So technologist and Luddite, I think we try to keep both of those ideologies in place at the same time. Playful, fanciful, and serious at the same time. Idealist and pragmatist. Champion versus skeptic and lawful and chaotic. Um, just a little bit about kind of how, um, it's a little hard for, um, at first it was hard for me um, coming from a more free context for doing my work as an artist out and about in the world. I used to run uh, an artist run space called Sea Level in Chinatown, which kind of, we did a lot of different um, free-form art technology experiments and um, coming to an institution it was difficult to see whether I could preserve some of those um, ethos within this institution. Um, so these are some examples of some projects. Um, this is Crumb Lord which is a project I did in the game lab as part of our food game jam dinner, which was a three-day event of 12 meals in a row that were playable. That's some of us playing it in the game lab. Um, this is an example of kind of projects that I work on. So Vietnam Romance is a project I've been working on for four years. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, instrumentalization in a minute, but this was an example for me of a kind of project that uh, is often very hard for me to position in the world because it's a game, but it's not marketed. It's a computer game, but it's not distributed. It's a political work, but it doesn't have a clear ideological point of view that's easy to explain. It's fun, but it's also very unfun. Uh, it's permanent, but it's also impermanent. Uh, it's finished, but it's not finished. So there's a lot of ideas that go into making work that are hard to translate to structures um, such as institutions, but we're trying. Um, and this is just the end of that. Um, so this is the Game Lab's website for people who are interested in seeing more of what we do. Um, it's at games.uclaedu, and if there's a little minute or so, I can show you a sampling. Uh, a few examples of projects uh, from the lab that I feel represent um, some of this conflation of ideologies. Uh, John Brumley's Guatari Hero, which is really a kind of strange navigation of Amazon's barcode system as a sound music installation game. Check it out, it's strange. Uh, Sophia Staub's junk game about capitalism and heroin, um, which is a playable multiplayer game with this gooey electronic interface. Uh, John Brumley again and Alex Ricketts, software, etc. cetera, are really wonderful project about exploring a mall with strange creatures that you can text through your phone by wiggling your hand around the screen. Um, and many more projects, which hopefully we'll get to for a minute at least. Um, but here's kind of the core of what I wanted to talk about is it's a little bit of a practical thing for any of you who might be interested in creating spaces uh, in the future and uh, avoiding uh, or finding really your space. So this is a Venn diagram I <laughs> drew to try to show where the lab exists. And as opposed to existing in the intersection of these three worlds, which the lab is actually very connected to, I find that it exists 
in between all of them and um, at first this was very challenging, but now I see this as a really sacred space to preserve uh, and the lack of overlap is really important. And if you see these three worlds, they're all related to games. So the art world, because we do a lot of games and art in the game lab, which the art world is quite suspicious of technology uh, in general, new technology. Uh, the game industry, which loves technology and would love something like a game lab in the institution, but doesn't really like what we do um, usually because they say we already do this stuff and all the rest is just useless and no one's going to get a job um, and we're not going to give you money. Um, and then there's probably the more challenging uh, world to, to interface with, which is a new um, big part of gaming in institutions, which is useful games, games that do something useful. And um, I'll talk about all these a little bit, but in some ways I value each and one of these, even though this seems a little negative and cynical, I really value um, a lot of each one of these three areas, you know. Um, I even have notes of what I value about them. I can read those to you. Um, for instance, um, I love art for art's sake, and I love eccentricity and idiosyncrasy. Um, in the useful game section, I love polemics and a commitment to activism. And from the game industry, I love the joy and wonder that some large-scale games offer and the focus on craft and rigor um, that those world, that world brings to us. But what happens uh, is I feel that each one of these spaces where games exist have come to instrumentalize games and try to um, conform them and use them for some other purpose. For instance, um, education, therapy, social change, those are all really wonderful, valuable things to do. I call these benign instrumentalization of games. They're basically looking for games as a tool, like a video could be used to teach something. Um, and the more malignant uh, version, which is gamification, advert gaming, manipulation, addiction, sort of using games on the dark side. Um, there's been a lot of literature, this is just a very small sampling about how um, great games are, how you can do so much with them and they solve so many problems. And um, this particular kind of twist right now comes from the history of demonizing games, so it's a kind of overreaction. Um, talk about that a little bit if we have time. Uh, problem with the art world's relationship in a sense is that games are seen as technology. Um, tech is not art. Um, why would we support this? We should support the arts that help support, um, that need support and tech art um, and uh, entertainment already have support. So why would we support this kind of art when we really should be supporting violins and painting and um, poetry. This is another challenge. Uh, and then the game industry, which I really see as, these are the negative sides, I suppose, but pipelines of people is what they're interested in, pipelines of technology, um, and games as commodity. So these are part of the problems of interfacing with the game industry, is they very much want to instrumentalize uh, academia in this case. Uh, there's some pipelines. Um, a really brief history of instrumentalization in the case of games. Games used to be just games. No one cared about them. There weren't too much thinking about them. Uh, computer games came along, and a little bit before that, D&D &D a little bit, but uh, games were bad for a while. They were addictive. They were, um, you know, caused violence. They did all kinds of bad things. And now we're kind of in the games are good again phase. Um, games will teach children how to use a lot of technology and they'll get good at computers and the games are going to fix the world and let's like reclaim this space to be really useful 
And that's kind of the main real instrumentalization, instrumentalization that's happening with games that I'm somewhat disturbed by because it's all over the place. Pretty much almost every game lab I interface with uh, all over the world, this is what they end up doing with their labs. They, fund, they build the labs so that they operate within this third category, that games are somehow a great thing and that they should be funded and that that's why we need games because they are part of the future in a very positive way. And I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> another brief history of instrumentalization. Um, who cares about silly games um, at first, then games are the future, uh, cinema is dead, games are the medium of the future, games are where all the money is, let's get everyone into games and technology at the same time, isn't that great? Um, and you see these kinds of narratives all over the place about money, money, um, it's the ludic century, it's the death of narrative, it's the era of games, yada, yada, yada. Um, and the last sort of brief history of instrumentalization here, um, which is games are fun. Um, games are here so we can escape the world. Um, games let us escape ourselves. And this kind of instru instrumentalization also limits games in a sense. In some ways, it's sort of saying um, they are entertainment, they are escapism, they shouldn't be anything else. So I think um, I don't really have like a positive uh, ending to this talk, <laughs> but I thought I probably should. Um, so this is kind of positive, but I feel like, and I mean, this is kind of a trick, I guess. For me to preserve this space that I value, it's important for me not to stake a claim in any of those three spaces and to still look at games as a medium that hopefully has a tremendous amount of potential to be explored, um, and we should keep exploring it more, but who really knows um, what it can do? But I think it's really important to kind of hold your breath and, and hold, hold your commitment to what it is all about and take all aspects of them and try to allow them to intermingle. I think that's the kind of magic of it when it can happen. Um, I don't know if I'm out of time, probably. Um, you know, this probably doesn't work anyhow. Um, oh, it does. But I want it to go, oh, different browser. Which browser were we on? Nope. Hmm. What is that? Hmm. Ah. I'm not sure what browser we were on. <laughs> well. Type it in. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just to um, let me see. What am I doing? View, view, full screen. But I think, um, yeah, if you just look at the kinds of projects that are done in the lab, they're really wonderful, and we just have really wonderful students and I think I, I look at it as a kind of protectorate, protecting uh, creativity and experimentation and just seeing what can happen within a space like that. So these are just some of the projects that have been done in the lab. These are all pretty deep and rich and interesting experiences so I encourage you to look at them. Um, a lot of these folks are here in the room so you might see our projects. Um, and Maybe to wrap up, we do all kinds of other stuff in the lab, too. So um, we do talks, we produce software, we do events, um, workshops, tutorials, um, tools for artists, um, game jams, all kinds of things. So, um, so I think um, that's about it. But yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thank you all so much. Um, there's coffee outside. Um, thanks. <laughs> hey, everyone. So 
We want to take a moment and before the daylight goes out, take a big group photo with as many people involved as possible. So if you could just kindly like move your way to the grass, the photographer is waiting there and, and we can do this as quickly as possible. And if you're doing um, a, lightning, a, a community open mic talk, the, the, the sheet is fully signed up. Um, we're, just, we're running a little late on that, so we're just gonna postpone the time until we finish taking the group photo and stretch out a little bit and we'll come back and start that. And Dorothy right here will be facilitating that. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice just because you're joyful. Awesome. OK, I am not a type A personality. Just ask the processing team. Um, <laughs> but we are going to keep this tight. So five minutes for each speaker. I'm going to, and these are the, this is the community open mic. And um, obviously, we're not going by time here. But I want to just quickly call out the people who are here that have volunteered to speak. Ariel, Q, Tanush, Thank you. Nick, Megan, Rosa, Rosa, okay. Angie, Cedric, Chris, and then Taeyun. Awesome. We have everyone here. So first up is Ariel, and I'm going to keep time. Uh, oh my, okay, you know, high five. Thank you. Oh, oh, uh, not this yeah, one. Uh, that's right. There it is. Oh, is, is this, hi, hi everybody. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna start the timer on my phone. I think that's a good idea. Uh, Hey everybody, uh, my name is Ariel Weingarten. Uh, I guess I'm a PhD student at the University of California at San Diego in the design lab. Uh, and I didn't intend on giving a talk, but I saw like, oh, community uh, open mic, what a great idea. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a little uh, art project I made, um, you know, generative design, uh, and how it led me to the processing community. And one way I'd like to engage the community further. Uh, so right here's a picture of uh, something I just call, this is like a stack of woobles. Uh, slash generative, and I was like, I will make this, and I'll make this with the latest software tools du jour that I've heard of, uh, Haskell and a, a library called Diagrams. Uh, and so I just want to walk you through how I made the woobles, and then uh, how it led me to processing. Uh, so how do we go from circles to woobles? Uh, well, you take a circle, and then we need to add a wobble to it. Uh, and so a uh, useful way to think about circles, and maybe I'll just like do a zoom job here, uh, is in the polar coordinate system where you have a function of the angle and it's like equal to r, the radius of the circle. It's like constant, nice. Uh, and so now like, we need to add something that goes out and then back in and out and then back in. And we may remember from middle school or whatever school that uh, cosine, sine, these trigonometric wave functions, if that's like the right way to say it, uh, do these things. And so you get like a term like this, like uh, r over 100 times cosine of 5t. Uh, and that has like three parameters. One is the magnitude, how big can the wobble get? Uh, the second is frequency, how many wobbles are there? Uh, and the third is the phase, where in the pattern are we beginning? Uh, and here's like a not very good diagram of uh, frequency, getting more wobbles, magnitude, how big the wobbles are, and the phase of the rotation. Neato. That's like a wobble. Now, but we have a stack of wobbles that we're very curious in. Uh, and you know you just start putting them on top of each other, and naively you know you just keep putting the same wooble on top of one another with a bigger and bigger radius. But it's concentric and it's a little trippy, but it's not that interesting. What we really want are squiggly woobles, and it looks more like this. And so you know what we're doing with our three parameters: magnitude, phase, and frequency. Is we're just sort of like sampling from a range, and it's like okay, each one has slightly different parameters, and we get this squiggly effect. Um, now the colors are also like a quite a bit of interest. Uh, as you can see, like there's a lot going on in the colors here. Uh, but some patterns that may not jump out to you is will always be a light noise, and like it looks like it's like on a piece of cardstock or something. Uh, you know, we had a visiting artist, and they're like materiality, and I was like, yes. Uh, uh, and one thing is that uh, you know this is like a full circle, uh, and so when you originally do, you get this like cool little image, uh, but. I love woobles because of the way they interact with one another. They're very social creatures. Uh, and so I, I cropped out just like this part of the image where you kind of just get to see what's going on here. It also hides this unfortunate artifact going on here where the woobles don't line up at the beginning at the end of the circle. Uh, but whatever, it's cool. Uh, so I posted this on the internet for fake points. Uh, and uh, I got so many, it was so good. Um, and someone uh, made it an approximation P5JS. And I was like, whoa, that's so cool. I might go and tweak some of this stuff. Uh, and immediately, you know, one thing that's kind of a bummer about Wooble is that there's so many, and to me, there's so much depth and understanding and ways I might like expertly manipulate a particular Wooble. 
And one thing I'd love to do with the P5 community, or anybody who's interested, is I'd love to like click on a particular Wooble, get all the vertices that make up the outside, and then just start moving them. Or do like a Monty Python where you get like that 2D image, and then like one of them starts spinning, and then like a person comes out or something like that. You know, I, I'd love to make this more of a bi-directional editing environment. And if anyone else thinks that's kind of cool or like wants to see what like writing generative art with Haskell is like, please talk to me, shoot me an email. I don't know, I'll be around. And that is my five minutes. Thank you, everybody. Whoa, very cool. Thank you, Ariel. So next up, we have Q. I'm Chen Chen. Uh, I'm an artist from China. Uh, you can find me on the bottom left corner of P5JS website. Uh, oops. Actually, the the emojis didn't work in the present mode. Uh, so I'm just gonna do this. Yeah, so that's me basically. Um, today I'm gonna talk about processing uh, community day in Shanghai. Uh, this is the website for the uh, for the event, which will happen in February 24th at NYU Shanghai. And right now we're having an open call for talks, workshops, and artworks to show. And I'm here actually because I actually need some help. The reason is most of the uh, social media is not accessible in China, so actually it's really hard to find and you know promote this event in any of this social media. And so right now, we are having a uh, processing WeChat account. If you scan that, you will find our, uh, uh, you will find a page like that. And right now, my collaborators, uh, Cici Liu and Yu Li Cai, they have been posting a lot on this um, uh, platform. Um, so right now, we are trying to mainly promote this event on WeChat, because that's the most accessible uh, social media in China. And we have our Twitter account, but it's mainly for uh, connecting with the community outside. Um, we are still experimenting what's the best way to organizing a community event in China, because I think that probably is the first time processing will have an event in China. And we don't know what is actually the best tool, so if you have any idea, or if you want to share this with your friend in China, creative coders, um, just you know, share this with them, and you can come talk to me if there's any other um, solutions you prom you suggest for a situation like that. Because I think this might be pretty unique for for this location. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Tanush. Hi, my name's Tanoosh. Um, I don't have anything to show you today, but I just wanted to make a quick little pitch. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, this was my first uh, community day, and I just had such a great time um, being surrounded by this community of creativity and getting to see all of your ideas and your projects. And um, so I really wanted to bring that energy uh, to our organization, Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, we just started an accelerator around augmented reality, virtual reality, and gaming. And uh, we're kicking off uh, with our first ever hackathon, April 12th through the 14th. Um, so it's a three-day event. Um, the first day would be pitching your idea. The second day would be working um, with developers, engineers, creatives like you um, to come together um, to come up with a pediatric solution that um, big names in the industry would um, work with you on to be confirmed who that is. 
But um, so if you are interested, um, please email me at tdey at usc.edu. Um, I'd love to talk about talk to you about um, how you could maybe work with us, even uh, speak at an event um, or speak during the three day event, um, pitch an idea. Um, so very excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, we're we're making good time, Nick. Awesome. So slapped this together in between sessions. I don't know if we'll actually hit five minutes. I hope. Uh, I'm Nick. Uh, I teach high school mathematics uh, and I coach UIL computer science in Texas. Uh, it's been a really, really fun day hanging out um, at sessions, getting to know a few of you, um, playing around a bit uh, with hacking and stuff. So gone auto run. Whoop. Um, <coughs> Just wanted to check in on uh, my use of P5.js and processing in teaching math uh, and helping build collaboration in a competitive team um, and then hopefully get some help uh, on projects I'm working on. So uh, this is my first year teaching high school. I uh, started uh, in education as a makerspace director for a little K-8 through school. Um, lots of room to play there. Uh, get to those projects in a bit. Um, what we've been up to, actually this practice on Thursday. Um, UIL, the University Interscholastic, Interscholastic League, uh, organizes competitions, academic competitions across the country. Um, our computer science team is too strong, um, some of the best nerds that you've ever worked with. Um, and yesterday, uh, after reviewing uh, test results from a test that they took on their own time, um, found that uh, stack and queue data structures were a sticking point for them. So after a real quick lesson on it, let them go for it. Um, this is a sketch that one student created. Um, was wondering where the text input widget was in processing and I informed that there wasn't one, but built it up from principles. What would a box be drawn with? How would we get text on the screen? Um, what kind of data structure would you need to control all that input? And he came up with uh, an app that would draw sh whatever shape you'd like. Um, another high school student who uh, is a great graphic designer and has won awards um, for drawings and animations he's made in Flash. Uh, it's not quite as strong at Java, but did make a mean triangle um, in his project. So uh, those two talked about it for a little minute, um, copy and paste to later and a quick talk and triangles were added to my other students' app. Um, really great to see those guys going at it uh, so fluidly. Um, I teach or coach that uh, club after school, but um, during the day I'm in Algebra 2, uh, which is variables and graphs and plots and domains and all kinds of things like that. Um, oh, you have some more notes. Oh, solid. Okay. Um, so, Try to get up and running in the fall with using processing on our phones to code. Um, seemed a natural fit for teaching a function in mathematics and to um, create functions on our own um, in code. Um, fall starts there with the phone-based bonus projects. Um, so rethought it over winter break and we're actually taking a day out of the week now to do Algebra Lab, uh, which is in our Chromebook lab. We've going to start, whoops, from scratch, uh, their creative computing curriculum is awesome. Um, pulling some of the math resources and moving into P5 uh, later this spring. Um, so one of the assignments I'm working on now is teaching systems of inequalities um, by having them reflect on P.A. Monjohn's paintings, um, thinking them in more mathematical terms. Uh, little history there, my geometry lessons with fourth graders involved taking little Lego Mindstorms robots and figuring out how to draw a square, um, what that might actually mean, building up a system of, or a sequence of commands. Um, and in conversations with faculty uh, and administrators, it looks like uh, we're gonna be able to bring 
some of our favorite toys into a new CS pathway or what we're calling kind of like a high school version of a major um, next year. So excited to bring all this, um, hopefully find people on the internet and uh, that's me. Thank okay. you, wow, there's still some time left. This is going so smoothly. <laughs> um, Megan, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Megan Moore. I am an artist from Montreal. Uh, I just finished my master's at the University of Guelph, and so I'm essentially trying to like aggregate my thesis research into like a really small time right now. Um, so if I go over, just like flag me down, and it'll be a cliffhanger. Um, so this is I'm, what I'm going to do is read for you an excerpt of this piece that I wrote, and it's called um, "Anti Heroines and Ectoplasm." A worm lives in my back. It burrowed there during my childhood. The worm makes its presence known with movement. When I shift positions in an abrupt manner or favor one side of my body, it pushes back to reclaim its space. The worm seeking comfort slides under my right shoulder blade, then folds through the tendons and sinew as I sit down to right. I stretch the, I stretch the left and ease the discomfort. Pain ripples through my upper back and neck. Aside from a slight pinch under my arm, the pain subsides. Ectoplasm had a gelatinous, luminous quality and oozed from the mouth, nose, ears, breasts, vagina, and fingertips of a medium during seances. It was regarded as a manifestation of a spirit entering the physical world. The expulsion often caused great pain to the medium. Ectoplasmic excre excretions vary depending on the medium and at times were solid or would take the shape of a face or body parts. At other times it was fluid and contained imagery of spirits or memories. A consistent trait, though, of the ectoplasm was its connection to the medium. The substance recoiled and the medium flinched in pain when the ectoplasm was mishandled. Ectoplasm internalized, externalized the internal. This week there was no outdoors. The sun was overwhelming, it's the worm. Having once loved the sun, the worm now needs me sedentary to subsist. To feed on my, sorry. <laughs> Uh, where was I? Okay. To feed on my energy, it needs me to lay in bed, leaving me questioning if it will ever let me be. This is when it's most alive. After continuously picking at my skin in attempts to release it, a scab forms. I immediately pull the outer layer, hoping the worm will take a hint and leave me and find another host. The first known sample of ectoplasm was produced by Italian medium Eusepia Palladino. Charles Richet, a renowned scientist, attended one of her seances in 1894 and examined the production of the sample. Advances in microscopy pointed to the existence of protoplasm, a jelly-like substance that holds together living cells. Richet remarked that the substance expelled by Palladino resembled protoplasm, and based on this experience, he called the substance ectoplasm. Richet writes the following on the medium Eusapia. Simple rustics like Eusapia do not understand the simulation of a phenomenon as a serious crime. They do not recognize the enormity of the fraud. A lengthy education is needed before they can be made to understand how odious and unpardonable it is a lie that brings willful error into our poor efforts at truth. Class and gender prejudice doomed the findings of the cyclical researchers from the outset. They were unable to fathom being fooled by women they consistently underestimated as weak and unintelligent. The most significant driver of the belief of ectoplasm was fear of the unknown. As scientists such as Richet and Albert Schrank Notzing encountered women who were sexually open, expressing radical political views, and cursing during seances, they believed the only explanation for this behavior was mental illness or otherworldliness. 
Either conclusion pushed these women to the periphery and further mar marginalized them. After a few years of mediumship, typically many mediums fell back into poverty as their followers learned of the falsity of their claims. It is hard to find information on much of the lives of these mediums beyond their practicing years. Once the research, researchers stopped attending, the mediums faded away. Researchers and spiritual, spiritualists wanted to believe that an afterlife could be scientifically proven with technology. And the spiritualist movement demonstrated a consistent need to, refill, to fill in the gaps, even if the results never entirely added up. Through the pursuit of the spiritual truth, though this pursuit of spiritual truth reflects the scientific drive of the time, it also reflects a larger phenomenon. Technological advances meant that the world was transforming quickly and early death was common due to war and spread of illness. Societal norms were changing at a rapid rate as equal right movements were forming. Death, technology, and movements of social change converged to create a fear-driven portal from which ectoplasm could emerge. Sitting in a quiet, dark room, I feel the pain pushing through my face just above my jaw. It circulates around the bridge of my mouth, pushes towards my nose, and the worm is a, is a serpent now. Straining everything it touches as it makes its way through my nasal cavity. Suddenly, the pain subsides for a moment and reemerges behind my ear. The serpent travels between my jawbone and ear canal. The pressure focuses as though it will burst, but it doesn't. Momentary relief only comes from pressure applied between my ear and jaw. After the plane slowly climbs back through my jaw, <laughs> okay, I can end it there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rosa. We're halfway done. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Rosa Weinberg and I'm an artist and an architect and I teach interdisciplinary design studios to middle and high school students at New View Studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I wanted to talk about something that happened this summer that made me start thinking about something. It gave me a way at, a textile, at the textile lab at Fab Lab Barcelona. I worked with this incredible group of women um, run by this space, uh, run by this woman named Anastasia and I'd been, I didn't come into the residency with a project. I'd been thinking about chrysalises and monarch butterflies and monarchs getting stuck in chrysalises. And they'd been doing a lot of 3D printing on fabric um, at the space. And so I sort of had that in my mind. And they were printing on fabric as a way of creating these shapes. And sort of elsewhere in my mind was this project um, some architecture students had worked on at the architecture school. And when I started thinking about what I wanted to make, I was, I was stuck. I, and I ha only had two weeks. My boss gave me two weeks off from teaching to do my own work. And I was so stuck. And I couldn't figure out what I was excited about. And ugh, it was, it was awful. And I was so stressed out. And I called my friend Joe. And he said, you need to go on a walk. You need to wake up a little early. And you need to go on a walk. And then when you get to the space, don't sketch, don't, don't go on the computer, um, just work by hand. And I worked by hand, and I made this thing, and it might not look, very much, look like very much, but it started me on this journey where I was exploring what it would look like if your garment held on to you. So instead of something hanging on you, like a shirt or a dress draping, it held on. It had a mechanical um, relationship with your body. And so this was sort of my first prototype. And as you can see on the left, it's just a piece of fabric, but it was holding on to all the curved parts of my body. Um, and then I sort of started experimenting a little bit more um, with the, you know, the elbow and other parts of the body. Um, and I ended up making this actuated mechanism, 
where there was a symbiotic relationship between the mechanism and the fabric. So the mechanism needed the stretchy fabric to actuate, and the fabric, which was just a rectangle of um, spandex, needed the mechanism to hold on to the body. And it turned into this dress, which was just two rectangles of fabric. Um, and I was happy with it. And when I started looking back at this project and thinking about it, it made me sort of think about that moment I had when I was really stuck, and then I went from being stuck to having something I was excited about. And through just looking on the internet at what people have been writing about, I found this book from 1926 called The Art of Thought. And in it, there are these four different stages of um, creativity that are outlined. And this doesn't just happen once. This happens every time you're trying to figure out something that you've, you've never thought about before, that's never been thought about before. And I got really excited about the sort of second phase. And not just for me, but for my students. But this is the phase when you need to put technology away and you need to bore yourself a little as a way of letting your mind get, your unconscious mind get, its, get itself around the problem. And I thought about other times when this had happened. How much more time do I have? Uh, about a minute. Oh, that's it? OK. Uh, I thought about other times, like I got really stuck in the computer during another residency, and then the laser cutter broke, which was fantastic. And so by hand, I made this. And this was for a choreographer that I work with. And um, I made that by hand, and then I made this. And I was thinking about another project I did, and I got stuck underground and I, on the train in New York before there was Wi-Fi. And I started doing sketches of fingernails. And I wouldn't have thought about this if I hadn't gotten stuck underground. And it became this great project. <laughs> um, fidget spinners are thankfully not in anymore. Um, <laughs> But I made chopsticks and a pencil that you'd always have. And you know, if you need to build up strength, or you know, the only practical one I made was that guitar pick. But I did, uh, an op there was an open house, and I did an, a sort of nail salon for men, women, and children. And um, well, I'll just keep going until, this is why I teach. I do a lot of stuff around the body, so this is speculative design. And these are all the projects, do fashion. And I don't let my students use technology, except for after they figure stuff out, because they love the laser cutter. And if they could, they would just stare at the laser cutter all day. Um, but then they would make boxes. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. <laughs> I'll start a timer too, Dorothy. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Angie Chow. Um, I am a teacher um, in San Francisco Bay Area. I've taught at an all-girls school running the Makerspace for six years. And this year, I'm heading up uh, Innovation Lab, which is a design, engineering, and computer science program at a different school, uh, now co-ed. So there are boys uh, in uh, San Mateo. Right. So um, one of the, I'm not talking about any of that, but today I'm talking about a class I'm teaching, which is Code Art. Um, and actually there will be themes that are kind of echoing what Rosa and Nick both said, um, but the population I'm teaching is actually pr quite different from uh, the, the population Nick was talking about. These are not kids who are thinking they're techie or really good at coding. They are rather uh, kids who are like, I don't think I really like coding. Um, so I kind of drawn them in with like, we're gonna make pretty pictures and let's go from there. Uh, so I actually started with this assignment. This was uh, a reproduction project, so reproducing, reproducing this piece of artwork by Damien Hirst called Mickey. Uh, they loved it, um, and the, I mean, it's very simple. We were, did it in P5. Um, these are all their kind of reproductions. Uh, one, actually, you can see kind of maybe, I don't know. I don't know if intentionally phoned it in a little bit, but I don't know about students like that, uh, or creatively adapted the, uh, the piece. Uh, so from there, I, this was mostly just done with ellipses, right? Like ellipses with different circles and getting really good at the cornice system. At the, ne uh, the next project, I started kind of going down this path, which I always go down, right? Which is when you teach computer science, either a lot of times you present students with a blank canvas and say, hey, make, this, make something cool, and then they're most students just kind of look blankly and then are overwhelmed. 
or you, uh, many of us see that happen, and then we're like, okay, let's start them with, a, with code that I write, right? template code, and then they get to tinker with it. But the problem with that is that they felt they felt like, oh, well, only the teacher could have written that, and I could never have written that. So this past Thursday, actually, I tried something a little bit different, so I experimented a little bit, so I thought I would share with you the result of that. Um, so I actually put this prompt, can we write code that creates new art, and harking back to uh, Nick, I actually showed them we're going to make a Mondrian generator, right? Um, and so the first thing I asked them to do as a class, this was like about 12 kids, uh, what are some common features? And they all yelled it out. So this is, again, no, actually I did not allow them to open their laptop. There was no technology, just tell me. And so they were like, oh, different sizes, rectangles. What do you guys notice? Any, shout it out. Squares. Squares. Black what? Black lines? Primary colors, great. These are all things that they noticed, right? They had a few more. So I was like, okay, but now we're actually going to sketch it together. And so what I did instead of showing them starter cool or a blank canvas and telling them to work individually is I pulled up a blank canvas or this thing, actually pretend it's blank. And instead what I had them do is actually just tell me pseudocode in English what they want me to do. So I became their code puppet. And so we created this program together. Um, and it was actually incredible. Like actually the students, many of the, it was like uh, I have a half, uh, female identifying students and half male, all of them participated. They would excitedly try to puzzle it out. Like one person would be like, well, you need to draw a rectangle. And then at some point I would keep testing and the rectangles would just go diagonally down the page. And then one kid's like, oh, no, 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 you have to somehow make it go across. And then that's when I say, well, have you guys heard of this thing called a while loop? And so that's what, how I actually introduced them to different programming constructs. And I thought they actually did pretty well. So this is a program I would say is created and designed by seventh and eighth graders at Nueva School as translated by me. Thank you. Thank you. So we have three more. Next up is Cedric. Hello, my name is Cedric Tai. I go by he, him, his. I'm an artist, educator, and a friend. Uh, I have an idea that I'd like to present that maybe dovetails with this conference. I call it the first annual ADHD conference for artists. Uh, ADHD is actually a misnomer, so this Dr. Russell Barkley has given us two much better terms. Time blindness and intention deficit disorder. Um, about 4 to 5% of the adult population has time blindness, and I'm looking at a subsection of that that have gone into the arts. I've already begun some preliminary research into artists with intention deficit disorder, and when I took a poll of uh, people to see if they can see signs of ADHD in their work, or if it contributes to their creative work in any way, the responses went against assumptions I had that people went into art because it was more forgiving and it could be more on one's own terms. Often, the overwhelming self-management tasks overshadowed other beliefs, such as the, necessi the necessity for hyperfocus or being an empath. Dr. Barclay says that those who do good work do it despite having intention deficit disorder, not because of it. And YouTube channels such as How To ADHD devote a good amount of time to note aspects that seem like superpowers, quirks worth appreciating, and both can be right. Uh, this focus on how those with time blindness experience intense extremes, feelings of all or nothing, and the reality of stopping altogether in the face of adversity parallels economic extremes that we are seeing in wealth uh, inequality in America and in the world. This is not a metaphor, but rather the activities that artists with ADHD take on where often lives are made up of clever strategies for survival, these are a barometer for economic systems with particular demands of flexibility or failure placed on people, not on situations. Amongst the few respondents that have worked for years on being as self-aware as possible, they lamented the lack of research and useful resources for adults with intention deficit disorder and that they've had to figure out everything on their own in a complex story of failure, devastation, and self-moderation. I often work with other artists and pride myself on bringing them into a fold of a different way of thinking and working, 
helping others see the possibility of what I imagine work to be, and how work can be redefined to address salient local and cultural topics. There are two questions I'd like to present with these uh, ADHD conference, which are controversial, uh, controversial and personal. What is the relationship to ADHD and being an artist, using my own practice as a starting point? And could ADHD symptoms illuminate and even confront capitalism, where those with a disorder who fail to meet its demands find solidarity? Uh, with where I am with this project, someone already gave me a great example of how to start the conference. So if anyone's interested, uh, the recommendation was first, go on a hike, then eat some protein, and then talk about ideas and topics around ADHD. The second one was uh, to maybe think of it more of an art piece and maybe even parasitically attach it to another conference. So if you'd all indulge me, I'd like to uh, give you an example of how I work. If I could get some audience interaction, please take just a moment to think of some of your favorite words from this conference and I'm gonna ask you to just kind of shout them out to me so that I'm gonna actually make a visualization of a, a small report of how people experienced this, which then gets put onto the thing that helps people know what people are talking about. Feelings, performative, accountability, welcoming, democratize, alien, Woogles, impossibility, collaborative, feelings, white words on black backgrounds, reflection, feelings, the invisible labor being made visible, drawing, play. All right, thank you. Do I have enough time for a second piece, a visual poem? 10 seconds, great. Mumbling some kind of anecdote about trying harder. Blah, 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 blah. Baggage, blah, blah. Subtle passive aggressiveness about Asians and affirmative action. Blah, 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 blah. Baggage, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cedric. Thank you. Chris, please. Can I get the browser back? You can start my time. I, I. Awesome. All right, my name is Chris Coleman. I'm a, pro <laughs> I'm a professor of emergent digital practices at the University of Denver. Um, in case any of you are also here from the other side of the Rockies, uh, please, uh, I'm organizing the Processing Community Day in Denver, February 9th. Uh, we'd love to see you and get you involved, so please reach out if that's of interest. Um, I'm also here, uh, starting a brand new organization called the Clinic for Open Source Arts. I've got stickers, so come talk to me. They're great stickers. <laughs> um, it's, a, a, it's an organization that's trying to figure out um, how to create a clinic that can make healthy open source projects for artists, um, especially, a, a, I'm, I'm focusing on tools right now, but I think that becomes more expansive later. Um, I've got funding and now I want the right people to help. So if you've got a project in mind, whether it's something you use or something that you wanna help improve, um, please, please reach out to me. Uh, I'll be here tonight and tomorrow and so on and so forth. Um, 
And uh, lastly, I will mention that uh, my Emergent Digital Practices program is hiring tenure track this year. If there's anybody on the market, uh, we're looking for somebody awesome like this community. And um, uh, last, we are always looking for grad students too. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. Finally, <laughs> Taeyoon. I'll start while we set up the projection and stuff. I could actually tell the story without the projection. So if it doesn't work, it's fine. Um, I'm from the School for Poetic Computation, which is an artist-run school in New York City. And I would like to tell you a little bit about it and what we are doing tomorrow here in LA. So it's a school that's a hybrid of, it's a school that's a hybrid of a research group and a residency for artists, as well as a postgraduate program for artists and designers and engineers who are looking to uh, create something interesting with technology. Our motto is that we want more poetry and less demo. And we're inspired by historical examples of alternative institutions like the Black Mountain College, in which their manifesto says that the student, rather than the curriculum, is the proper center of the school. To repeat, the student is the proper center of the school. And that a faculty to be measured by what they do with what they know. So we have teachers and students with degrees from institutions, and we have people without high school degrees. So it's a, not an actual university, but it allow, that freedom allows us to experiment and be inclusive in different ways. So no connectors? Okay, that's fine. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I can, can I just have the screen on? I feel terrible about taking so much time. So I'm just gonna speed forward and if we don't have it, it's fine. Um, idea is that we are trying to create different kinds of institutions where the relationship between students and faculty becomes the foundation for the curriculum. And I'm, I'm just trying to make a case that we would love to see you at the school if you could come through. Um, we have a lot of public events these days, conferences, workshops that range from one day to three days to two weeks. Our main focus is based on the our 10 weeks program, which runs in spring and fall. And that's a full-time program. But we're also trying to create more uh, opportunities for other folks who can't commit 10 weeks to be part of it. And I had uh, some student example works. And I guess we could just show um, some images from current session. So we, we're doing a program called um, Code, Paper, Scissors with Kelly Anderson and Robbie Kraft looking at the connection between mathematics and uh, origami. Very excited about this one. And we did a public event called Code Ecologies looking at the environmental impact of technology. So such as this cloud computing, all the heat that it's generating or the resources that it's taking. And all of our curriculum and uh, finances are published online. So that, that's a part of our uh, principle is that we like to be transparent and we wanna treat our school as almost like an open source project. So you can see how we operate. Yeah. 
thanks so much for all the staff. Thank you. <laughs> and also the cart um, professional has, has been amazing. The, yeah. All right, so I'll go fast. And um, we have family dinners, uh, which happens almost every Wednesdays during the session. So we encourage you to let me know through email or social media that if you can come, come, wanna come visit us. Students and teachers cook together. And some of our projects look like this from the Mariko Kosaka, which is, uh, which is a translation of a vector image in, into textile. And slow games by Ishak Bertrand, which, in which he wanted to slow down the time. So it's a computer that runs on one clock cycle per day. And some of our uh, teachers collaborate with students. So Zach Lieberman, my co-founder, worked with, uh, I think, about 20 students to recode historic artwork that are created with computation and using the software tools that are available today. So these projects were shown in um, art festivals and other venues around the world. Some of our teachers that we work with, some of our recent student work, Mar Marcus Fleming, who made a tech sup um, emotional support for tech workers, Neda Bomani, who made a ship out of resistors. Um, it's based on the historic ship where the first um, African Americans were um, shipped from you know, Africa, and she was interested in the idea of resistance in both ways. Here's Neda, American artist, teaches critical theory. And Nabil Hussain and Sonia Bowler and I created um, the Code Ecologies, which is a conference about the environmental impact of tech. So these are, we, we balance the, um, our tuition-based programs and our free programs. Thank you, sorry, I'll, I'll finish in two seconds. And here uh, at Learning to Teach tomorrow, um, I apologize that I think some of you might not have known that we are organizing a small conference here tomorrow. Um, if you're around, please come by. Um, it's, a, it's a space for educators and people who are interested in becoming educators to meet and talk about pedagogy, curriculum, and syllabus. We like to call it like teacher's lounge. And <laughs> we have amazing speakers coming and um, representing different aspects of education. And a Processing Foundation has been a big supporter of this project. So let us know if you're interested in coming through and we'll be here from 10 a.m. And also the event will be live streamed. So just check out our social media and um, we'd like to connect with you. Thank you. Wow, so what an amazing day today, and what a wonderful time. I felt so incredibly inspired myself, just walking around and seeing all the different amazing and diverse activities that's taking place all within the, the realm of a processing community. And it's just wonderful to, to see um, that people are engaged and seem to be having a good time, I hope. That was true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, we would love to get some community feedback. So if you have any specific feedback for us, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, if you ha have the time, um, you can email us at day at processing.org. And I'm gonna make the wrap up really, really quick because I think we're all you know, exhausted and, and ready to just relax. Um, I'm gonna try, try to keep it really short. So the last things I wanna say is that um, aside, this is actually, the Processing Community Day is actually happening from January 15th to February 15th, um, a whole month in different cities all around the world. And this is something that I've also been 
organizing with the amazing help of the Processing Foundation. Um, and so far we have more than 100 node cities registered to host a Processing Community Day in their cities. <laughs> I, I would just like to um, like give shout out to uh, people, the node organizers for other cities who are actually here at this event visiting. And if you can just come up to the stage and just, just remind us what, what city are you organizing. If you want to say one or two words about it, that would be great. Uh, I'm organizing Processing Community Day in Shanghai. Denver again. Uh, Minneapolis at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Uh, in Chicago at University of Illinois Chicago on February 2nd. We have two in the Netherlands, one in Utrecht uh, next week and one in Amsterdam in three weeks. Uh, I'm organizing one in Lahore, Pakistan. Hi, I'm Lee. I'm organizing uh, with many other people uh, Processing Community Day in New York on February 9th. This is so incredibly exciting for all of us. And um, if you want to find out more inf information about the Node events, you can go to the website and just go on the worldwide page and just click on different pins and that's where you can like find out how to contact the person, the organizer, or maybe there might be a website or they have information. Um, so just want to put this out there. And we are also going to quickly invite um, the organizer uh, for each theme track to, to come up and just give a few remarks on, on their experience and, and what, what kind of ideas came out through the track. So let's have AM and Dorothy for the radical pedagogy. So I have some very nice things to say, but right before I do that, in the spirit of my day and my pedagogy and transparency, if any of y'all have any Benadryl, I'm literally breaking out in hives right now. So just saying, find me, my hair's big, and please give me a couple Benadryl, because I do not want to go to the ER today. Anyway, I'm fine for now. If I fall down, I have so many witnesses, and y'all help me, so it's fine. Um, so the words that I thought, uh, Shin asked me to, you know, what words did you, um, came to mind and what kind of experiences did you have today? And I remember all throughout this day, pretty much from the beginning, I had these thoughts that didn't align with like a tech event. I felt, um, uh, is there such a thing as a feel good conference? Um, does it make sense to describe this place as homey, like familial? Um, I, I heard kids laughing and frolicking and like that was amazing. Um, I watched, one woman in a conference like speak her truth. Benadryl. Woo! Oh my god. Thank you. Thank you. This. This. This is what I'm saying. Like this. Seriously, thank you. Like I can't say any more than that. I'm gonna take these Benadryl and like take away. Thank you. And and let's um, also have. Taeyun and Johanna come up for accessibility, disability, and care. Uh, the lightning talks were great. We talked about pain from visual uh, perspective, also sonically, and thinking about pain as a form of inspiration and something that could be shared, and also. Some of the speakers were very honest and um, they were able to be vulnerable and um, generous with their, uh, their life stories and what care means to them. And they asked, um, if we can code in a way that we would care for somebody that we really love, perhaps the world around technology might be quite different. Um, I just wanted to say my highlight was getting the proposal from Best Friends Learning Gang which was titled Alien Porn. And the explanation was clearly we're gonna have to have sex with aliens at some point, so we should design the dildos now. <laughs> and I just think that's so cool. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, and and next one up is um, Chandler McWilliams for Epic Play. Hi everyone. Uh, it was a pretty great day uh, for me. It was very busy. I'm a little bit scattered, a lot scattered now. But I got to see uh, kids making games for the first time, people imagining transformations and counterfactuals for the present by thinking about futurity. Um, and I got to see Patrick Ballard sing to all of us. So I think it was a win. Thank you all very much. And last but not least, um, Tiga and Sam for Under the Silicon the Beach. Um, yeah, thank you to all of our contributors and speakers. It was so inspiring. Uh, we started the day um, hearing about some histories of resistance from Rumi, which I think are so relevant now. Um, histories of redlining and, and the Green Book. Um, so that was a beautiful start to our track. Um, we had a couple of wonderful workshops on some more experimental uses and web technologies like distributed web and a fabulous local nets workshop by, by Alden. Um, and then to conclude, we also had a really um, wonderful workshop by, by Rupa, who uh, was really uh, invited us to think critically about what we're doing as artists and our claims to uh, critical practices, which I think was a really important thing to end on for us as well. I don't have anything much to add except to say uh, thank you so much to all of our amazing speakers and to the organizers and especially to all of you guys who made this day so amazing. Thank you. Okay. I, okay, I have to, I have to put someone on the spot. I'm really good at volunteering someone to, Shin. Shin? I'm, I'm seriously, I, I'm such a crier, so I'm going to try to like oh keep it God. light and upbeat, but I, I want to recognize the fact that as a lead organizer, okay, I feel myself getting emotional. Um, <laughs> as a lead organizer and director, um, you know, and filling the shoes of Taeyun, having done the 2017 uh, version of Processing Community Day over in the East Coast, but making it global. I don't think you understand the magnitude of work that has gone into what you've done today for all of us. And thank you so much to the speakers, the track coordinators, but none of this would have been possible. See, okay, see, okay, I'm like choked up. <laughs> none of this would be possible without you. So I just want to thank you so, so much because I think there's so much labor that goes into a day like this and it's really magical. And I could be stressed and Shin would be like, everything's gonna be okay. And I'm like, how do you do that? How do you do that magical thing that you do? And this is um, really, really big and important to recognize you. So thank you so much. Please give a big, huge round of applause. Aww. to um, just give also special thank thanks to Lindsay Stoker who has been yes. working really hard all day um, our live captioner <laughs> yeah. and, and also Bl blushing again <laughs> also um, Kit Kirby in the back helping us with live streaming And, and KJ being so like generously, like being the, the kind of uh, lifesaver okay. and helping us with all the different file switching. <laughs> and there, there are so many um, people and helpers today to thanks. Um, and I, I don't think this can ever happen without everyone's um, contribution and, and this, this willingness to create a warm community. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Do you still want to talk about the foundation?
Oh, yeah, so okay. I'm here, so here, I'm doing my jobby job. So the Processing Foundation, <laughs> Processing Foundation, uh, you wouldn't, we, we need the community, obviously. And so if you want to learn more about what we're doing, the fellowships, the fellows, we're so close to wrapping up and picking and selecting the 2019 fellows. We're really excited to announce that. Um, please visit processingfoundation.org. Again, as Shin mentioned, please let us know. Give us feedback about the day. Uh, there is a community survey. I can send that out if you sign up for our newsletter. So how many people are signed up to the newsletter? Awesome. So those that didn't raise your hands, please sign up. Um, but yeah, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that we do have a medium publication. So everything that we do, we document. So what you see, when if you're excited about a fellow and the fellowships and the work that's being done and you want to check out what is happening with Google Summer of Code, we actually have documentation for that. The participants work so hard with our director of advocacy, Ioana Hedva, to write some really wonderful um, narratives around uh, what's been happening with their work and research. And then the last Last thing I'll say is before we party is a membership. If you're interested in becoming a Processing Foundation member, individual, studio, or if your educational institution is interested in becoming a member, please consider joining us and helping us sustain the community and the things that we're building for another 20 years. We already thought about what's gonna happen on the 20th birthday of Processing Foundation. So like, <laughs> let's, let's like gather together, help, help us, and Ben, in case you're probably like, well, okay, let's not, let's not go that far yet. We, we just, let's finish this year. But um, no, seriously, so it's really important that um, you, you learn about what we're doing and, and keep, you know, be in community with us, build with us, and help us stain, sustain what happened, what happened today and what's happening globally and all around the world. And thank you again for joining us. So, so wonderful to see all of you. And please talk to the artists and let's like celebrate. Yeah. yeah. So we have the reception now. Um, during the reception, there's going to be two installations down here in this area. Please visit them. The first one's by Kate Hollenbach. Yay, Kate Hollenbach. <laughs> and the second one's uh, Raven Kwok. Raven, are you in the room? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to transition down here, and then we have wine reception um, out in the outside area. Thank you again so much. Oh,